starts with complete clarity on where we are and when, where we need to be. So as an example, if you need to lose weight, you know the best way to lose weight? You just decide one day, okay, this is where I am. This is where I need to be. And then you every day measure, every day look at that new weight you need to be. And you keep making changes every day, course correct every day until you get there. That's how you lose weight. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's the same in doing any project or building a company. You decide what it takes for you. If you're here, you want to get there. What it takes for you to make a micro progression in that direction. Yeah. Right? And then you do that in the day. Then you do that the next day. And the next day. And the next day and you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can say, you know, uh, anything that you plan. Right? When Mike Tyson said, uh, you know, plans go uh, or even you get hit in the face. Everyone has a plan until they yeah. get hit in the face. Yeah. So you will get hit in the face. But if you do the day right, yes, the gains add up over time. Yes, it's very people. Comp people compound. look at yeah, they yep. compound. Yep. People look at those gains. They don't realize it's actually it's a lot of small things you do that add up. And so if you just do that day correctly, where you have the right mental state, you have the right physical state, and you're planning it and you're doing the right things, eventually it'll happen. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Pitch Cafe podcast. To me, this is the moment I've dreamed of for more than a year, ever since I heard Mohit's talk here. Okay, let's find out who Mohit is first before we get him to uh, come on the podcast. I'm, ta I'm talking here to the father of hyperconvergence. He's a person who invest invented the coolest technology out here. And anybody in the B2B SaaS community will know what his contribution is. But before that, why is it that we have this person on Pitch Cafe? I have a ton of things I'm really curious about. How does this man have the Maidas touch of building one unicorn after another? Do you know the startup failure rate is nine out of 10 startups? 42% startups fail because they don't understand market need or they fail in their execution. Do you know that most startups do not know how to conduct a meeting and 42% of meetings go as a failure. And here we have one person who has mastered all this and mastered many more things. Basically, he has the magic recipe of succeeding at anything he puts his mind to. So if you want to succeed in your career, don't miss this podcast. Mohit, welcome to Pitch Cafe podcast. Thank you for having me here. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, you are right now the co-founder of two successful unicorns. So tell me, uh, tell me who is Mohit Aaron? Who is the person? <laughs> You're from IIT Delhi. You're like this ace PhD from Rice University. Uh, you uh, literally invented the Google file system, if, if I may call it so. And then you come out and you build a company like Nutanix and Cohesity. And, uh, you're redefining technology the way it is. So you're a person who's very good at building things from scratch. But other than that, there's uh, you're a father, you're uh, you're a husband, you you're a friend to so many people. Tell tell us who is Mohit. Well, Mohit is very frankly, it's I'm a very simple person, mm -hmm. and all I believe in is putting my best every day. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That is Mohit. Nothing Perfect. more than that. Okay. Oh, everything else is a side effect. <laughs> okay, I I'm going to bring up all the amazing facts. <laughs> you know, people talk about. What do you think is missing in the way people go about startups today? Why are nine out of 10 startups failing? We can start with that and then let's, let's dig deeper. Yeah. yeah. So I'll draw an analogy, right? Let's say uh, you join, um, nothing wrong with them, but let's say you go join a legacy company mm -hmm. and you expect uh, your stock to double, you know, overnight or in six months. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Right. They move slowly. So what I'm trying to say is that um, you operate in an environment and you need to have your expectations set correctly according mm -hmm. to that environment. Mm -hmm. um, what most people do when they start a startup, they don't set up the right environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll go in the wrong environment and uh, they'll try to work very hard and then they scratch their head. What the hell? I'm working 24 hours a day. I'm barely having any sleep and yet this company is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like, you know, if you work in that old legacy company and you work very, very hard, it's not like the company's stock is going to double every overnight. Yeah. So 
so what people don't spend enough effort on is to set up that environment correctly mm -hmm. right uh, once you set that up correctly and then you work hard within that mm -hmm. there's a much higher probability of uh, you know bringing success to the company to your venture but if you don't have that right setup around you mm -hmm. and you go in and you just start just you know kickboxing <laughs> you know yeah. Yeah. flailing around you're not going to be successful yeah so, nine out of ten startup yeah. failures is dismal it is dismal something yes. wrong with the way startups yeah. are being yeah. built you know i don't want to use the word startup anymore if this whole structure is set up for failure and you're saying that nature wants to look for survival of the fittest <laughs> i think that is very dumb because human beings are smarter than nature so tell us how to build a startup well let's start with um the first thing what is wrong with the way startups do meetings how do we do good cadence meetings you know do should startups have cadence meetings at all you know what is wrong with the way meetings are done yeah okay by the way that's already you already started the startup so there's a bunch of setup you need to do before you even start a startup that okay, needs to be set up correctly okay let's start with how, yeah. let's say i'm having a meeting i'm ideating with you about doing a startup uh how would mohit who has built two successful unicorns and several patents or self patent for the uh, you know products tell us how does mohit go about ideation yeah. so first of all i'll tell you the sad truth which is that a lot of people come to me for advice and just in a discussion like this i am able to deflate their idea hmm. but they are so emotionally tied to it it's yeah. almost like they won't listen and i know that this company is not going to go anywhere but they'll still go and do it so my point is the first thing you got to do is you got to be objective and not emotional um uh, you want to uh literally be brutal on yourself uh about the direction this company can potentially go in if literally as a logical discussion between two people if you can deflate the idea you really don't have a company mm. so what does it then mean to uh, what is a structured approach to thinking about a startup Yeah. right so uh um, you know there is a a uh, website uh, somebody put up where if you search for my name mohedaran and then framework it comes up so i put up some 10 filters first of all mm -hmm. uh, i'll give some examples and sure the audience can go and look at uh, the, the the web uh, the first filter i put in there was uh, you know is it a good neighborhood yeah right if you're doing a startup in a neighborhood that has tons of dead bodies mm. well you're going to have trouble raising money you know a lot of companies die because they're unable to raise money or they'll raise a little but they're unable to raise subsequent rounds there's probably a good reason why these other companies are dying yeah. right um, and you may think that you have a different approach or would have would have you a venture capitalist to whom you go to to raise money is going to say well the last entrepreneur who came to me said the same thing yeah. and i put money in that person and i lost money yeah so you need to you know do a company in ideally in a decent neighborhood if yeah. it's like a neighborhood filled of dead bodies well you know have some some friction yeah another one is that you need to do a company where uh, the overall size of the market let's yeah. call it a tam total address. right total addressable market yeah needs to be at least a few billion dollars yeah if you let's say you do a company where the tam is a few 100 million dollars yeah. not even 1 billion dollars yeah what's going to happen is that there are going to be tens of companies opening that space yeah. let's say it's you know 200 million dollars right the tam is 200 million dollars and let's say there are 15 companies or 20 companies opening that space yeah right so every company you know will you know some companies will do better some companies will do worse but their average revenue is going to be in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 million dollars yeah. at max yeah and that is not enough to build a unicorn Yeah. right for yeah. a unicorn startup you roughly take a multiple of 10 on revenue yeah. you need at least 100 million worth of revenue mm. if you can if your market size is limiting you to a revenue of about 10 to 20 million the vc the venture capitalist also sees that they don't want to put money in that so is this applicable to corporations mm -hmm. where people are starting new business divisions do they also have to do this tam thing let's say i'm a meta and i'm starting a metaverse business division yeah do you think this applies to meta also um yes and no um yes if meta cares about uh how they're also they have limited money to believe me yeah. these big companies even though we think they have lots of money yeah. they need to also um you know apply that money in a wise way yeah so they want return on investment 
So if they're like, well, okay, I'll invest here, but it's only going to give me at most 10 to $20 million worth of revenue. Yeah. They're like, well, this idea is not good enough. I'd yeah. much rather invest in another idea right. which right. might yield me more. Yeah. So yes, it's more applicable. Yeah. Sometimes I said yes and no. So the bigger answer is yes. Is yes. But sometimes uh, for strategic reasons, they actually might. Mm. Uh, they know that the money that it will draw is lesser. Yeah. But perhaps it's an important part of their overall portfolio. It makes yeah. their portfolio complete. Yeah. Right? Maybe they're losing too many uh, deals to a competitor yeah. because they don't have the small piece when right. their competitor does. Right? So it right. becomes a matter of sales objection handling yeah. to customers. And so they might invest. Mm -hmm. So that might be the reason they might. But if they're investing purely for investing purposes that, hey, well, they want to grow revenue, then they're going to look at the ROI. And yeah. the ROI, if they're measuring the ROI in dollars yeah. and they don't see the dollars, they don't want to invest. But if they see the ROI in another way, yeah. then they might invest, right? Wonderful. So that's the yes and no. But the VCs are more or less, they're not, in, <laughs> they're not yeah. investing strategically. They're yeah. investing because they want to return. return. Yeah. Uh, if you can show that return, not going to happen. Okay. So again, these are some of the setup things you need to think about, right? Yeah, uh, there's one thing you said, um, you know, how do you determine whether it's a clear pain or not? Yeah. How do you know when you, when you come up with an idea, right. you think it's a pain, Yeah. And maybe you talk to 50 people, maybe right. they think it's a pain, right. but how do you really know it's the pain? Well, a pain is something that uh, you absolutely need to address it right now. If you, you, that, if, you yeah. if you can address it in one year, it's really not a pain, it's a good to have. Mm. So sometimes, you know, it's said that um, if it's a pain, if you need an aspirin and not a vitamin. Yeah. Right, a vitamin yeah. is a good to have. Yeah. Right, if you delay it by a few months or by a year, it's no big deal. Yeah. But the pain is if I have a headache, I need the medicine now. So you know when mm -hmm. you built um, hyperconverge yeah. uh, convergence technology, that was so ahead of its time. How did you know that it's going going to be a pain ten years later or five years later? How did you see that vision? Yeah. Or if somebody is somebody as perceptive as you, uh, keeping their eyes and ears open yeah. all the time, how do you teach them to? Right. Spot pain. So I'll give you the method, uh, but the first thing is that pain. Yeah. Right. So the pain is not so much about hyperconvergence. So I'm, by the way, a big fan of going in with sort of a minimum viable product that addresses a pain. Yes. And then having a bigger vision that you can grow into. Wonderful. So the hyperconvergence yeah. was a little bit of that bigger vision. Mm. So I'll explain why that bigger vision made sense. Yeah. But let's talk about the pain. The pain that we went into was the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we addressed a pain in virtual desktops. Mm. So at the time, uh, you know, a lot of companies were looking into setting together a virtual desktop environment yeah. that they can give to their task workers or sometimes even to knowledge workers. And the problem was that to set up a virtual desktop environment, right, they want to put a lot of VMs. Uh, you build that infrastructure, the traditional way to build that infrastructure was to bring compute, storage, and networking from different vendors together, and it was very complex. Mm. So by the time you build a virtual desktop, it was actually more expensive than a laptop. Yeah. So it didn't make any sense to build a virtual desktop mm. because it might as well give a laptop to the person, right? Yeah. Um, and another big use case we saw was actually uh, in, in the army where uh, at the time the Afghanistan war was going on and, uh, you know, the army could not carry lots of laptops and they needed something, you know, uh, of a small form That's factor. That's pain point. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. could fit at, at the back of their Humvees. Wonderful. They don't have the ability to kind of carry large data centers and stuff, right? So compactness became an issue, right? So and so... Did you win that customer? We did, in a big gosh, way. In a gosh. big way, yeah. So so these were the immediate pain points. Mm. Uh, now let's talk about the bigger vision, right? So I actually uh, advocate to people who come to me for advice that they write what I call a hypothesis document on why your technology is going to be successful, right? So you start with the description, right? Okay, this is what I'm building. But the more important part is there are three sections. Um, the first section is, um, it's not in that document, by the way. <laughs> um, the first section is, uh, you know, what is your minimum viable product? Hmm. What's the first thing you're going out with, right? Hmm. So precisely tell what it is. Um, also lay out, you know, your bigger vision and stuff. Now, the second section is very important. Why do you think it'll win? Yeah. Right? So in the case of Nutanix, for instance, uh, the reason, the one of the big reasons was uh, the fact that it was very compact. I gave you an example of where it appealed to. The second reason was, 
you know, compute was growing at the time. Um, storage speeds were growing, but network speeds were kind of not growing in proportion mm -hmm. to the compute and network speeds. So uh, having this complicated legacy infrastructure, which kept the compute and storage separate yeah. uh, with a slow network, didn't yeah. make any sense. So mm -hmm. hyperconvergence was hence born, where you kind of collapse compute and storage and bring them on the same platform and try to get the networking out of the way. Right, so these were the the pros of what we were doing. Yeah. Right. So I said there are three sections. The first one is what is the minimum value product. The second one is why, uh, why would you win in the yeah. market? Why do you think this will fly? Yeah. And the third section is what would the naysayers say mm -hmm. if there's a naysayer? Yeah. Because it's very easy for an entrepreneur to be emotionally tied to what they're doing and they're only looking at the positives. This, the third section forces them to put themselves in the eye, in the shoes of a naysayer. Yeah. So what would a naysayer say? Yeah. And what's your rebuttal against that? Mm -hmm. This is the section that forces you to be objective. Yeah. Right. So for instance, a naysayer might say, well, there is such a big industry out there uh, and you may not be able to beat them. Yeah. And you might say the rebuttal is that, well, there is a niche that you can go attached to, which that industry, industry cannot serve. W whatever those answers are, but you need to be very objective about them. Mm. Right, so literally, if I go to a customer and that customer happens to be an ASR, my rebuttal should make sense to that customer. Now, it's never 100%, but if I'm able to convince, you know, a large fraction of the customers I speak to who yeah. start in an ASR kind of way, yeah. then you literally have a company. So if this hypothesis stands, yeah. as long as it stands, yeah. you have a company. I almost guarantee you build this hypothesis and it stands, you will have a company. Wonderful. That company will, the only other reason why you might fail is because you didn't execute well. So it's one thing to, now you've set up the environment correctly. Yeah. Right, at the beginning. Really now you've got to execute within the environment. Yeah. Because it is possible that you don't execute well and somebody else copies the idea and they execute better than you do and yeah. then you're dead. Right, so then it's all about execution within that environment. Wonderful. You know, uh, very perceptive. You you think like a programmer. A good programmer set up, set up the environment. They care about the environment. They care about everything they work yeah. with and then they start coding. They yeah, I don't code, code. I, I, I'm a coder <laughs> myself. I say that I do not touch the code until I'm very clear about the requirements. Mm. And then I have a design that meets those requirements. Once mm. I have that clarity, then I'll start coding. Because if I start coding too fast, uh, I'll, I'll just, it'll pa patchwork after patchwork and delete, deleting code. I don't like deleting code. Right. Uh, mm. You know, one of uh, the people I work with that my company recently said, you know, between me and him, I wrote some, the last couple of months, wrote some 15,000 lines of code. You did? He wrote, he wrote, wrote a, you know, a few thousand too. And he's like, he tested it, and there was literally not a single bug. <laughs> and he's like, this is unheard of in industry. Are you I've kidding? Never, like I've, right now, why do you have to write code? Well, I love it. <laughs> you love writing code, okay, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I can still sense your passion. So for that's the, yeah, yeah. that's the real innovation, right? So yeah. you, you know, if you take a sculptor who's passionate about their art, yeah. you know, it it shows itself in the art. Yes. My art is the code. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> and you bring that thinking to many different levels. So let's yeah. let let's explore that more. I, I one thing was nagging me when you were describing uh, how you uh, pick an idea that's going to work for mm -hmm. your startup. Mm -hmm. If I'm a disruptive startup and I'm creating something which is not out there, yeah. how do you um, sell this vision mm -hmm. how to, to the naysayers? Right. People say, let's say they, this we're in the era of horse cars and right. somebody's talking about jet engine or mm -hmm. like a motor car. How does a motor car guy sell it uh, to the... Through that hypothesis document. Again, so the hypothesis. I, I go back to that hypothesis document. Also, I would suggest one more thing. You know, look, if you're a founder... Uh, and you seem like you have a cool idea, just hold hold for a second. Uh, what I would like you to do is study the various uh, companies that got funded in that area, in that general area for let's say the last three to five years. Mm. And by doing that, what you will see, uh, look, there is a reason why those companies got funded. Yeah. Right. The venture capitalists are also smart people. Yeah. They did their due diligence. Yeah. So they clearly are seeing some things that these startups can do. Yeah. Right, so, so so you can extrapolate. It's not, you know, doing a startup is not so much about what might be happening in the world today. Yeah. It's about what will happen in the world a couple of years from today. Yeah. And that you can get a good idea of by looking at what companies are getting funded. Yeah. So by doing that, you can sort of start drawing trends. If you study enough companies, you start yeah. drawing trends. And then yeah. you can also start 
seeing the gaps okay if this happens and if this happens then won't that be a gap yeah and then my company can come in and fill that gap yeah you see so so, so trend yeah. stacking correct you're stacking trends you, you stack trends correct so oh. and then you can build a much more informed hypothesis document yeah. that the world of tomorrow is going to look like this and this is what my company is going to do and this is why it's going to succeed and by the way if you're a naysayer this is how i'm going to rebut your if you have that now you have a literally a futuristic company yeah. that does that. So literally, I you know did that I, I, at, when I did my first company in Nutanix. Uh, all these ideas were being reformed, but I did this for history definitely, right? Amazing. So did you did you do this for your um, Google file server when you're working there? You built something new. Yeah. Did you have something like that there as well? Well, uh, uh, the answer is no. But uh, remember, Google was already a successful company when I joined, and I they was. They are big on OKRs. They are very big I'm on OKRs. Thinking, we can talk about that. This is very much like OKR. Uh, um, yes, but remember, it, this was pure economics. Uh, Google realized that at the scale they're growing, if they keep buying, you know, storage and stuff from outside, mm. it's going to kill them. Mm. So they knew that to get those efficiencies of scale, they have to build something in-house that is web scale. It was as simple as that, yeah. right? And yeah. then they uh, they got a lot of uh, benefit, of course, from the then downturn, if you remember, around 2002, 2003, right? Um, all the people were fleeing their companies, the companies were going under, and all the smart people had a, only a few companies to kind of go to, and Google was one big one. So yeah. Google got a lot of smart people coming and joining Google in that time. And so they were getting all these smart people. They were like, you know, buying, you know, all these complex storage devices from these vendors doesn't make sense. They don't even scale out. They don't even uh, have web scale. Why don't we put all these smart people to work and build something in house? Yeah. Right. So that's it was basically pure economics and what made sense for Google. So Google started uh, building a lot of their infrastructure in house themselves. And that yeah. really is the reason why Google, in my mind, I wrote an article on TechCrunch. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons why People can argue why Google won against Yahoo, even Microsoft, yeah. uh, in the search wars. But really, in my mind, it was basically because Google invested in the platform, yeah. and those guys never did. Yeah. Right? If you look at Yahoo story, they were still buying from those external vendors. So they're, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you have one use case, maybe you can uh, build that. But then you have a second use case, you have to build it all over again. Third yeah. use case, you have to build it all over again. Whereas Google, on the other hand, has a web scale platform. Literally, there was a time when Google was either putting, um, you know, work, you know, you know, applications on top themselves, like they're building applications like Gmail themselves, or they were buying companies mm. and then asking those companies to throw away their backends and move their front end, which is mm -hmm. what customers out there liked, mm -hmm. um, on top of this platform that Google had already built, mm. and that instantly gave them that scalability and stuff, right? So like they bought YouTube, they yeah. bought like small company that eventually became Google Maps. Yeah. Same thing happened, right? They just um, took their front end, slapped it on top of this very scalable infrastructure that Google mm -hmm. had built, mm -hmm. and they all kept getting scalability out of it, yeah. right? And so Google really was the, the big reasons in my mind that Google won was because they invested in building a great platform and the Google file system was part of that. And yeah, there's something to learn there when you yeah. build a uh, technology like this ground up mm -hmm. with uh, such a f futuristic vision to scale, uh, you uh, you become the leader in your space. People cannot compete with you easily. Correct. And that, mm -hmm. I think, was very good experience for you to build difficult technology yeah. for Nutanix, mm -hmm. which not easily imitable, and then and then Cohesity. Like, you came out and you, you spun out another unicorn. That's not mm -hmm. very easy to come by. It's something very unusual. So, so let's come back. You know, you said Google and you said OKR. So let's come back to this uh, concept. How do you look at goals? What is your concept about goal settings? And um, I know that where you put your focus is where your entire energy goes. Yeah. And that's how your life turns out to be. Whether it's personal goal or professional mm -hmm. goal, how do you do this with a bunch of people mm -hmm. who believe in your vision? And how do you get those people who are not on board? <laughs> on board. So it's a very difficult Yeah, thing. so let's walk through that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I'm going to break this up into a couple of things. One is just brainstorming. Yeah. Second is uh, alignment. Yeah. And third is plan, building plans. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is execution. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So the, let's come to the first one, brainstorming. The brainstorming. Right? People, people don't know how to yeah. brainstorm. They do not know how to brainstorm. <laughs> so here is the wrong way to brainstorm. Here is the wrong way to brainstorm, right? Yeah. Um, the absolute wrong way is uh, when... 
two people will brainstorm among, among themselves, then one person will go, okay, let me brainstorm with you. So they're all brainstorming separately. That, that yeah. does not work. Yeah. Whoever are the major stakeholders, they should all come together to brainstorm, right? But even on that, the wrong way to, brain, to you come together, the, yeah. the next wrong thing they do is they start debating right away. One person throws, you know, something and the other person, no, I don't like that, you yeah. know, it has these they problems. Yeah. So if you do that, you immediately kill creativity. Yeah. You immediately kill all productivity because all you're doing yeah. is debates. Yeah. You're actually not coming up with ideas. Yeah. Right. So I'm a big fan of uh, a concept I got from this book called Positive Intelligence. Right. So it literally uh, goes like this. You first... Uh, come and everyone gets to say their their piece. Yeah. Um, you kind of go. There's a mediator, and you go round robin. Yeah. And you first lay down. Everyone says what the current lay of the land is. Mm. Right. Uh, what are the problems mm. that are happening in the world today in their mind? Mm. And there's no debate about this. Everyone is is right. Yeah. So so basically, as you're going around, you write um, whatever they're saying in a piece of paper. Mm. Right. That everyone can see. So once people have exhausted uh, what they think is the lay of the land, what the problems are, what the issues are, in this phase, uh, we call it the explore phase. You're exploring yeah. the, the current lay of the land, right? You're almost almost doing a blameless autopsy. This is not about blaming people. The problem shouldn't be, oh, because of that person, you know, we are having problems. No, no, no. Here's the problem that's happening today, right? It's, no, it doesn't matter who is responsible for it or whatnot. Now, once people have exhausted um, you know, their opinions about what the problems might be. Then you move on to the next phase, which we call the innovate phase. And the whole notion of the innovate phase is that you need to come up with ideas. Yeah. Right? So again, you go round robin. And, and again, another rule is no idea is bad. Yeah. You're not allowed to debate ideas. I mm. cannot say, Vida, your idea, I don't like your idea. I can add to your idea. I can say, you know, I like that, but I want to add to that idea. Mm. Right? That's fine. But what I cannot say is I don't like that idea. Here is a different idea. Uh, that, because that yeah. kills creativity. You know, this is how we talk. Yeah. Nobody has taught us how to talk in an empowering way. That's right. So, so yeah. you start debating too fast, it kills creativity. Yeah. So, so again, you go round robin, and the idea is to exhaust ideas. <laughs> you know, yeah. let all the ideas come out. So again, the mediator is taking notes. You know, they're writing all the mediator. ideas. You have a mediator. Somebody becomes a mediator. Yeah. I, uh, one person, any one person can become a mediator. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So I that hope. person is literally calling names. You know, hey, Vida, you go next. Yeah. Hey, Mohit, you go next. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, Jack, you go next, right? One of uh, yeah. And then wh whatever ideas are being given, are, is, is either the mediator can write it down or another person can take that opportunity to write down the ideas. So now we have a number of problems, uh, lay of the land. We have a number of ideas. And once people kind of run out of ideas, yeah. Now you move to the third phase. This is where you open it up for debate. We call it the navigate phase. Now you mm. go back to the ideas mm. and you start debating one by one those mm. ideas, right? Mm. So either you'll accept the idea as it is yeah. or you'll have a debate and maybe you'll tweak it mm. uh, or number three, you'll just reject the idea outright. Um, so you go down the list of ideas and what you, the net of it is after this phase, you get a bunch of crystallized ideas. Yeah. Finally, you once that's done, you move to activate. This is where you put it in action. Yeah. And the first thing you need to do is you need to prioritize the ideas. So there's lots yeah. of ideas. Okay, which, one, which ones are the ones we should go... And uh, how do you prioritize it? Again, go down the list mm. one by one and mm. ask people for, um, it, you know, simple question. High, medium, low priority. What would you put? Mm, high and medium, high medium, low priority. It's very simple. P1, P2, P3, right? Whatever you mean. It's simple. Just attach priorities. So now at the end of it, we have collaboratively, and yeah. I'm going to use a a term that I've actually um, coined myself, I use it a lot, it's called collaborative alignment. So we collaborate, alignment. we collaborate, yeah. Yeah. and then we align. Yeah. So collaboration means everyone gives their opinions, Yeah. And but once everyone's given their opinions, yeah. we disagree and commit. That's alignment, mm. Mm. right? So we do the same thing when we attach priorities. Yeah. So if someone says that I think this is high priority, someone says, no, I think it's medium priority. Okay, that's fine, your opinion is also valid. But once we've all expressed our opinions and yeah. the reason behind them, mm. we say, okay, guys, everyone has expressed their opinion. We need to disagree and commit. Yeah. Right? And there is a way to go about doing that. But once you disagree and commit, okay, that's the priority. So do you mm. use any tools for this or you just do simple whiteboarding? Like simple whiteboarding, but you can also use tools. Um, so I can see yeah. we, meetings are not casual for you. No, no, not at all. Uh, we'll talk about meetings. Uh, there are multiple it's types of casual. meetings. This is a brainstorming meeting, right? So we're talking meeting. about, a, but there are, oh there are meetings, there are present, <laughs> presentational meetings, there are meetings that are actually execution meetings, right? There are different kinds of meetings. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so anyhow, at the end of the activate phase, you have a bunch of things you want to do yeah. and their priorities. Yeah. Now it's time to build a plan out of them. Ex so I said, first thing is brainstorming. Second thing I think I believe I said uh, is to build a plan. Yeah. Uh, then there is execution and there was some something in the middle too, but doesn't matter, but that's the order in which we'll go. Yeah. Um, so look, now we have a bunch of activities we want to do. Mm -hmm. So in, at the end of a startup, yeah. once you, you know, whatever founding team you have, you have a co-founder, maybe some advisors, between all of them, you have brainstormed on what yeah. needs to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you already have that setup done. Yeah. You already have, okay, I'm going to do a company in this space. I'm going to, this is what my company is going to do. It's now about how to go about building the design, blah, 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 whatever activities you need to start. Um, so now you have a bunch of activities you want to start. Now here is the important thing. Uh, any bunch of activities that you have, you will do them well if you organize them in a three level hierarchy. Okay. The first two levels come out of OKRs. Mm. objectives and key results. Mm. What are objectives? Objectives, think of them as longer term goals yeah. that go quarter over quarter. Yeah. Key results are basically milestones. Yeah. Some I like milestones that go one to two quarters, no more can than you, that. Can you give an example which like, yeah, you absolutely. really met so that we can Oh, imagine. hundreds. Uh, let's say your objective is to increase revenue. Okay. That's an aspirational objective. Yeah. Uh, but the second level is a milestone. Okay, in in maybe one month, we will grow the revenue by 5%. Uh, by the end of this quarter, we'll grow the revenue by 20%. Yeah. Right? Um, that's a very measure. So the second yeah. level needs to be very measurable. measurable. Yeah. Right? Um, and the third one is really the actual actions you need to perform yeah. to get there. Yeah. So it's uh, one thing to have like a milestone. Yeah. But you don't want to reach the milestone unless you actually do actions. Yes. So that's the third level. Yeah. Right. So, um, so we will build OKRs. Yeah. Um, so here is how the goal setting goes. Then, right. So, uh, first of all, goal settings happens both ways. I'm talking about a hierarchy of people, right? Top uh, down. Where top down, as well as bottom, bottom up. up. Yeah. So let's say, uh, uh, you know, I build the OKRs for the company. Okay. This quarter, uh, we will do this. These are the objectives, and these are the key results. The objectives might go quarter after quarter. They remain the same the key results or the milestones will change. change. Yeah. So I, I build what are called draft OKRs. Mm. They're not finalized. Mm. So I will give them to my executive staff. Mm. After looking at those, my executive staff, let's say there's an executive staff who's in marketing, right? Yeah. Chief marketing officer. They will build many of my uh, key results and objectives may not pertain to marketing, but some will. Yeah. So they will build their OKRs. Yeah. Uh, and they will make sure that whichever of my objectives and key results pertain to marketing, they accommodate those in their OKRs. Mm -hmm. Then they send it down. Mm -hmm. So they have built their OKRs, they will send it to their juniors. Yeah. So it goes kind of all the way down. Yeah. And then what happens is the reverse happens. So once, so everyone is kind of, I build draft OKRs, my CMO built draft OKRs, his lieutenants, his or her lieutenants build draft OKRs. Once they have then built their draft OKRs, um, they get reports from the bottom mm -hmm. that, okay, here are the cool things happening down below. Yeah. So there might be, oh, I didn't put this in my OKR. That's a very cool idea that you're working on. Yeah. So let me modify my OKR to actually uh, reflect that. Yeah. So I'm now getting the reverse flow. So my marketing person might be doing something cool, which I didn't realize we, mm -hmm. should, we are doing this quarter. So now my OKRs are modified to actually reflect that. Mm -hmm. So now my OKRs are not just reflected from a top-down view, but also from a bottom-up view. And that happens at every level. So uh, do uh, everyone get to see everybody's OKRs? Yes. Oh, wow. So we make the OKRs public. Wow. Now, I also encourage, um, in specific cases, to have private OKRs. There are always things that are company confidential, right? Uh, yeah, maybe we are, like the nest you know, disruptive technology you're building. It, it, that could be one. Or maybe we're doing making some uh, people decisions, or maybe we're doing some fundraising that needs to be confidential, or maybe we are acquiring a company. I don't know. Yeah, some partnership. So, so, yeah. so, in some people may have private OKRs also. Yeah. But every leader, in my mind, should have a public OKR, which is visible to the whole company. Mm. And these OKRs are informed, like I said, both on a downward path. So. Yeah. So you get, if you're a leader at this level, yeah. you're seeing what the leader above is making yeah. and you're uh, you know, formatting your OKRs based on that. 
but you're also seeing what the people below are making and yeah. your OKRs are getting influenced from that. Yeah, so it kind of goes both ways. Yeah, so Tim Cook has uh, made publicly the statement that by 2030, they're going to go carbon neutral. Yeah. And this year they released a video where they show how each, it, it's more like a marketing video. Every department is doing something to go carbon neutral. So, uh, so this is like an OKR. Stereotypical Absolutely. OKR. So, so every now department every department needs to have something that they're doing to become carbon neutral. Yeah. But it is possible that some department is doing something really cool hmm. on that carbon neutrality. Yeah. And when it bubbles up yeah. and Tim, oh, I didn't realize, you know, we are doing this. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put it in my OKR. From now onwards, I'm going to actually call it out that this project is very important in my OKR. Wonderful. Right. So this is kind of how it goes down and up. Uh, or it could be, you know, look, the way Gmail came about in uh, in Google was it was not a top-down thing at all. It mm -hmm. was like this one engineer who had a cool idea and they did a 20% project and Gmail came about. Nice. But when the founders kind of of Google saw that, they're like, oh, wow, this is cool. We should yeah. actually, you know, do this. Yeah. So imagine, uh, you know, I'm sure that, uh, that whoever that engineer was, uh, you know, his or OKRs would reflect the fact that he's building the next gen email. Yeah. When the founders of Google saw that, oh, this needs to be in my OKRs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right at the company level, that yeah. we are building the next, you know, the, the world's next email uh, service. Yeah. So oh. that's kind of how you learn. Not so it, it's, you know, OKRs go both up and down. And it's dynamic. Let's say a chat GPT moment comes, right. then everything is shaken up. So then yeah. you redo OKRs for the organization. And the next quarter, you will do it. In the next quarter, you know, new things will uh, enter into your OKRs and then they again percolate all the way down, percolate all the way. So this is how you align the whole organization, right? If you have yeah. a, um, look, in a team of five people or even 50 people, it's very easy to just, you know, talk to people yeah. and align them. Uh, but if you want to align a bigger company, any, anything I would say more than 100 people, yeah. then uh, OKRs are a great way to do that, right? So you what, what let the you organization think? go in the same direction. What if the organization is very big? Like yeah. it's got OKRs. Time. I mean, still Google, still when I left Google, it was 30, 35,000 big. And <laughs> I believe they still use OKRs. Okay. Even okay. though it's probably 100,000 plus big. <laughs> so I see that pattern uh, in everything you do. Okay, so let's, you know, when I use the word OKR, yeah. uh, I get two uh, main ideas coming out there. One is productivity, another one is performance management. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. in your in your perspective, in your execution discipline, mm -hmm. how do you tackle performance management? Mm -hmm. I know you're extremely successful mm -hmm. in setting up sales uh, team, sales heat map. Also, you talk about GTM heat map. <laughs> Everything is tied to this performance metric, sustainable yeah. performance metric. So. so so you can start with what performance metrics and we can slowly go to heat maps. Right. Yeah. So first of all, every leader, uh, every person in the company, they are measured by different things, right? Um, yeah. we, some of these things that you mentioned, these are more sales specific. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's generally talk about how, uh, you know, I like to do performance management. Uh, it is, I, I would say upfront hiring is very important. Yeah. But let's also agree that hiring is never going to be 100%. I do not know of a hiring algorithm that can absolutely assure that you will um, never have a mess, mm. right? You do need to do performance management. And I don't just mean firing people. You also need to elevate and nurture your good people. Good employees, you yeah. perhaps need to, um, you know, hold people accountable who are not performing and eventually even... Uh, part with some underperformers, right? That's yeah. very important. So how we go about doing that, how at least I advocate. Um, first of all, every quarter, the every manager needs to have one, con at least one conversation with the employee on how they're doing and stuff, right? Um, and this is a feedback exchange. Yeah. Um, so they honestly tell each other. So now I'm saying that because there, there are formal uh, performance management that happens so we'll come to that yeah but at the very least because you can't wait one year or uh, you know let's say you do a formal thing once a year yeah right uh, or we like to do it you know twice a year now one is very formal the second one is less formal yeah. and these quarterly ones are more well, between the manager and the employee so this is think of these as course corrections the manager and the employee they you know exchange uh, what the person's strengths are, and this is just between the manager and the employee. Um, but let's go to the big one, and then we'll come back. So the big one, yeah. everyone knows this. These are three sixties where HR gets involved. HR floats something. You know, uh, the manager selects reviewers for people. Yeah. The reviewers write, uh, you know, their assessment of the person. And what I like to do is 
everyone writes what are their areas of improvement, what are their, um, uh, their strengths, areas of improvement, and any other feedback they might have, right? Um, I think it literally goes, I've been doing it since Google days. Uh, Google became very good at this. First section, in the minds of the reviewer, what are the accomplishments? What has this person accomplished? Yeah. Second section, where are the person's strengths? Mm -hmm. Third section, what are the person's weaknesses or what are the areas of improvement? And last but not least, any other comments, you know, that you don't want the, the, the candidate to see. Is there something that you want to say that the candidate should not see? The first three sections are seen by the candidate. Um, so that essentially is what a reviewer does. Yeah. So the manager of the person now looks at all, all of these and they will write their own assessment. Mm. And by the way, the candidate is supposed to write also their self-assessment. Yeah. So reviewers you know, may not remember what this person has done. So the first thing that the candidate does is write his self-assessment. Yeah. And then the reviewers get to see that and they write their own assessment. Now the manager gets all of this at the end. Yeah. And the manager looks at all of the, this and manager writes his own assessment. Mm -hmm. And finally the manager gives the person a rating. Yeah. And this rating roughly falls into, uh, you know, uh, I like five categories. Um, you know, they're um, set in terms of expectations. So from the top, significantly exceeds expectations, mm -hmm. then exceeds expectations, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, uh, meets expectations, sometimes meets expectations, and does not meet expectations. This sounds like a yeah. heat map here. You um, sort right of, away. it's a, it's a, so it's not, this. it's, you can color code this, you can yeah. color, you can absolutely color code this, right? Uh, people have different, but important thing is to put them in a range. Yeah. Now, the, remember at so far, only the manager is rating mm. the person. Mm. Um, yes, he's looking at the assessment from a lot of people, but some biases creep in. Yeah. So to get out of those biases, um, what, are, what is very important is what is called a calibration meeting, mm. right? Where it's essentially a meeting where the, um, um, you know, other people come together to give feedback to the manager that, hey, I don't agree with your rating. You need to give a different rating for this, this, and this reason. Yeah. And again, we resort to collaborative alignment. So man it's not the manager's way or the highway. Mm. The manager has to collaborate and align yeah. with that team, yeah. right? Which consists of mainly the manager's peers yeah. and maybe his superiors, where they say that, I don't think that person in your team is that strong, mm -hmm. right? We are also looking at the same feedback and I don't see there are people complaining, but you've given the candidate a high rating. What yeah. gives? Yeah. So the the ratings kind of get adjusted, and uh, you know this is where uh, the ratings get finalized. And my goal, I strongly the, these five categories I I told you about. The bottom two are the ones that you eventually want to exit the company, mm. unless you can. It's up or out, right? Yeah. Either you elevate them. Um, so think about the bottom most one, which is does not meet expectations as C player. Yeah. The one above. Uh, which is sometimes meet expectations. Think of that as a B player. B player. Mm. The one above, which is meets expectations, that's a B plus player, right? Not everyone can be an A player, but there's value in B plus player, right? That's solid performance. So that's meets expectations. Then the one above is exceeds expectations, which is an A player. And the one at the top significantly exceeds, that's an A plus player. You know, right? uh, most companies have right. this relationship yeah. game, mm -hmm. where if they have a good relationship with all the manager and the peers, they somehow manage to get good rating, but in your system, yeah, they'll flag, they'll be flagged out. They're flagged out right. because, because of the calibrations. Uh, you have a competency-based right. calibration, correct? And uh, I know we're talking about performance management, right? But you do this for hiring also. Do you want to touch upon that? Yeah, right now? I will. So uh, yeah. the way the people get flagged uh, out is there. It's not just left to the manager. Yeah. If there's a a collaborative alignment of the manager's peers and they don't agree that this person is strong, well, that person is flagged out, Yeah. right? So that's how we do it in terms of performance management. And so now anyone who's in the last two categories, yeah. you know, either they'll go on a PEP or, or there's a, the HR then takes over and oversees that something happens. Uh, either, you know, they go on a PEP and they uh, eventually if they do well, then they can stay. Otherwise they're exited out of the company and that sort of stuff, right? Nice. At the same time, people who are high performers, they get rewarded well. Right? Yeah. They get higher bonuses, you know, refreshers, that sort of stuff. Now let's talk about hiring. Yeah. Um, a lot of, uh, I've done this myself, um, people make mistakes in hiring. I mean, literally the way, you know, they'll have it's a nice conversation. Most, most important thing. Most important thing. Because, you know, if you're if all you're doing is hiring and firing, then also your company is not going to do well. Yeah. 
because let's admit once you hire a person you're going to only going to figure out in at least 6 months that the person is not doing well yeah they have been doing damage after that and every time you fire someone people get scared and um, you know this yeah. person who's fired he has the, he or she has a bad taste in their mouth they're going to go out and totally bad mouth your company yeah. so you don't want to do it too much yeah. which means that you need to do a good job at hiring itself yes so the worst way to hire is to actually just have um, a discussion like this and <laughs> hey i really like this person because they speak so well i have a great chemistry match that's su- such a bad way to hire i'll be very careful when yeah. i apply to your company <laughs> <laughs> so um look chemistry match you know what what are you looking for when you hire a person you are looking for some attributes yeah right you're not looking um, at that person whether the person has the attributes or not uh, but the job has the role has attributes yeah. and you're basically trying to see if this person can satisfy those yeah right the person might be a great biker yeah. but you really need the person to bike in in the, yeah. in this role right yeah. so you're basically looking at whether the person's traits match the mm. traits of the role yeah that you need so I, we call them competencies. competencies so every role has some competencies yeah. right that uh, are desirable so let's say in a yeah. sales uh, role in a sales uh, job you yeah. want hunter somebody who can go out make the calls not Correct. be shy not be a farmer go, yeah right. and, and uh, go get the deal right. and get the signature right. you know get the deal in and then you you want to uh, farmer who sits there and say okay we got this deal now i want this guy to come back every month yeah. what do i uh, do uh, to get into the ecosystem understand what they need and right. you know we start doing so, something so i mean there, look there is a uh, there might be a role for farmers right so maybe you have a big customer yeah. and all you need to do is this person um, schmoozes the guy wines and dines the customer right yeah. so that they keep writing checks every quarter that's a farmer yeah um is the role for a farmer or is the role for a hunter a hunter yeah. basically has to create new logos they have to get new customers Obviously they have to the creatively board. think about how to yeah. get the next deal yeah so um that's just one of the competencies yeah. is it a hunter or a farmer yeah another one could be have they worked in enterprise companies before maybe yeah. you have an enterprise product or if yeah. you're a consumer product yeah. have they sold to you know end consumers right are you into b2c selling or a b2b selling yeah so so whatever those competencies are that describe you and no more than i i like to say no more than 10 to 12 mm. right um choose the biggest rocks don't go for the small ones where you're going for oh can they um write slides well well maybe that can be captured by a big competency yeah, called yeah. do they have good communication skills right yeah. good communication skills are good in sales yeah. once you know you generally feel um, that the communication skills are good maybe yeah. they can either learn or they already know how to present well yeah. or or build slides well right so don't yeah. go for every nitty gritty detail but go for the bigger competencies yeah. and no more than 10 to 12 of them because you can don't have time to test hundreds of competencies yeah. right so write the 10 most important or 12 most important ones that if they are met you are reasonably sure this person can do a good job and how do you decide those top 12 where is it coming from right so collaborative again i i strongly encourage uh, the hiring manager to sit with other people who know this role and collaboratively come up with those competencies right so again you go around the table and uh, one person proposes a competency uh, others you know um, debate that then another person proposes one and so at, uh, i, I it, it's so much more efficient to spend 45 minutes in a meeting to come up with the what i call a scorecard yeah. and these uh, of these competencies then the hiring manager writing all by himself they spend like multiple hours write something they'll send it on email then somebody you know uh, sends a comment it's very inefficient to do that yeah. much more efficient to come up in a meeting can i go round robin and build up these competencies and by the way i built three sets of competencies the first one is a resume match you don't want to spend time on a candidate whose resume is not a match for you hmm. right so even there you will look for some things right you can see what kind of companies they're they're coming from is that uh, the background you, you want like right? do you want a person who is like a networking background like what kind of background you want do you want a person who comes from an enterprise company a networking company whatever the uh, resume tells you that's yeah. one set of competencies yeah then the second set of competencies are interview competencies which is what the interviewers are going to use yeah then the third set of competencies is what you're going to do in reference checks mm-hmm. so um so these are three different scorecards yeah so um maybe a recruiter is uh, is is looking at resumes and scoring the first set of competencies 
So the whole point is that if the overall score, so they're mm -hmm. scoring every competency and you can come up with a scoring system, right? Uh, one, two, three, four for every competency. It yeah. uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, the scoring system doesn't matter. But if the average score is too low yeah. or if any one competency is scored too low, then it's potentially a red flag. Yeah. Then you, you know, need to look deeper, deeper in that. So a little bit tangentially yeah. to this, I want to ask one thing. I go to a lot of pitch events where I'm scoring uh, youth or entrepreneurs or startup decks at their mm -hmm. and they do their seven minute pitch, yeah. five to seven minute pitch. And then there's a score there's a score on creativity or ability to disrupt. It is so intangible. Like how do you score something like communication? Yeah. You know, what do you have to do in that case? Like Correct. creativity is such a um, yeah. So know, so which is why it's a potential red flag. Yeah. Like if the overall score is low. Yeah. If it's not just one competency, but your overall score is low, yeah. um, then don't waste time. Don't waste but if, time. let's say, one competency is low, so what you can then do is, uh, if it's just the resume, you, the recruiter can have a chat with the hiring manager. Yeah. That, look, overall, the score is high, but this one competency is low. A hiring manager say might say that, okay, let's, uh, oh, this competency is too important. If this is not great, I don't want to move forward. Or they might say that, okay, let's put the guy through the interview and maybe we'll have more people look at that competency and uh, figure out whether it's worth moving. Eventually, it's all about collaborative language. Yeah. Right? Eventually, there is a session that we do after the interview called a debrief session, which is where people come together and they discuss it. Right? Yeah. So again, like you said, some competencies might be a little, like everyone has their own judgments. Yeah. Yeah. But when they come together, that's and actually talk it out. Yeah. Then the collaborative alignment happens. And then they were like, okay, I think it might be okay. Or no, no, this is not okay. So it's so important coming yeah. together. Coming together is it's very so important, important, especially we enforce it for senior roles, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't, like, if you're hiring hundreds of people, uh, yeah. actually coming together for every candidate yes. is, is uh, it's a scheduling problem. So what we try to do is, if it's a unanimous yes from everyone, then people don't have to come together. Yeah. But, uh, and even for, uh, like, junior roles, the manager can make the call. Uh, but for senior roles, like uh, we we put the bar at uh, director level role, role and above, yeah. we do require that uh, if, if if everyone says yes, then you don't have to come together. But if if like there are mixed opinions, we do force a debrief meeting. Okay, guys, yeah. talk it out in yeah. a debrief meeting because mm -hmm. then sometimes people are hesitant; they're not voicing stuff. Yeah. But in a in a communication setting, a good one. they'll De debrief they'll meeting debrief is a good meeting. one. It's yeah. it's very important. So in mm -hmm. performance management, there it happens in the calibration meetings, yeah. right? People, people talk it out. Yeah. They may not actually write stuff. Yeah. But they actually talk it out, and in hiring, it happens in a debrief meeting. Hmm. Right, so that's where the real meat comes out. That whether they want to go forward or not, and uh, finally, you know, manager or whoever else does reference checks and they score based the competencies. As an example, one competency could be, uh, would you hire this person again on a scale of one to ten? Hmm. Right, so you're doing a reference check with perhaps some of that person's ex peers or ex boss or what have you. That's a good score. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and always ask him questions that force him on a numeric scale. If I ask, if you're the manager of someone. Would you hire this person again? You'll say yes. If I ask you on a scale of one to 10, you may say, well, a seven, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, okay, so why not at eight, yeah. <laughs> right? What did yeah. the person do? Yeah. Uh, what, what are the negatives? You're forced to reveal then, um, you know, why you're rating it a seven and not a 10, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the important part. I really want yeah. to ask you what kind of tool you will build that will enable this yeah, uh, we, we, effortlessly. We have enhanced <laughs> greenhouse to do this. Okay. So we use Greenhouse as our internal tool, but okay. I will admit that we, we've used Greenhouse APIs and we've built some custom automation um, so that uh, behind the scenes, we'll pull the data from Greenhouse through its APIs and we do some custom computations behind the scenes to then come up with per candidate scores, mm. right? Where literally we tell them that, okay, they score this much and whether to move forward or not. So we've done some of that stuff. But again, I want to stress that uh, hiring only goes so far, no matter yeah. what hiring algorithm you use, there are still people that slip through. Yeah. Um, right. Eventually, uh, hiring is not anything better than the interviewers themselves. Maybe the interviewers uh, did not do a, a methodical job. They just liked the candidate again and then gave every competency a 10, right? Uh, 10 on 10. Um, uh, or uh, they were overly harsh on the candidate or uh, maybe some one person had a loud voice and then they <laughs> managed to bring the candidate on board even though other people were kind of on the fence. So look, it happens. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, but I, the whole I, point I agree is, with you. Yeah. People who can think and execute very yeah. well, they may not have a loud voice. That's right. In all these group discussions right. and debates, they get sidelined. 
we are so brainwashed to yep. think highly of people who communicate well. communicate well so yeah. communication has an oversized impact uh, sometimes which is where you know uh, we really like the collaborative alignment part uh, which in the collaborative phase you can say your opinion but don't repeat your opinion yeah. because that's what loud people do right <laughs> yes. they keep repeating it, <laughs> repeating it right so in the collaborative alignment you know you yeah. say your opinion but do, do not repeat it mm. and then once all the opinions are exhausted there's no, no new data being added I, I literally say imagine there is a you know cup in front of you yeah right and you're putting your opinions in that cup mm. your job is to keep uh, filling that cup mm. once the cup is no longer growing yeah uh, you stop your collaboration is done mm. right and clearly by repeating yourself it's not going to grow <laughs> because yeah. it's already there yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your opinion is already there well, so um, so th if you observe those rules it's almost fail safe it's al it always works yeah. it just you know sometimes people come and tell me Mohit we did a collaborative alignment but it kind of didn't go this way that way I'm like okay tell me what you did like you really didn't do a collaborative alignment right go yeah. read the rules again mm -hmm. right you're supposed to go one by one yeah. and you're supposed to not repeat yourself and you're supposed yeah. to formally go into an alignment mode once you know, you're no longer adding anything. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, Mohit, I spent so much time on these uh, how to conduct meetings. In my second book, there are two techniques which come to my mind. One is brain writing, which is what you practice when you put your opinions. Every single person you go around, Robin, and put your opinions uh, out on a sheet of paper or through the mediator. The brain writing. Another yeah. one is brain sw swarming, where you don't talk. You, you write it down and you pass it to the mediator. Hmm. When you don't talk, you're not wasting energy on mm -hmm. communicating. So this is for the introvert people yeah. who are uh, who don't uh, who don't look very glorified when they right. talk. So it's kind of combining both. Is what it's I it's think. kind of combining both. Now it's also important. And the reason we are coming together is so everyone can eventually know what the other person is thinking. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, so that we're all informed by other people. This is this is one of the failures of um, you know uh, performance management. Yes. Is if uh, that calibration meeting doesn't happen. Yes. Right. So if all if all my HR department does is collect my assessment of a person, but I never get to hear about what others have to say about yes. that person, yes. then my my assessment could be very lopsided. Yeah. Right. So that's why I'm, it's okay for me to write my opinion, yeah. and that is just my opinion. Yeah. But then I need to get informed. Okay, what did others say? Mm. Right. What is the ultimate rating, and that needs to be a little bit more collaboratively aligned. So I may learn, oh, really, I used to think this about this person, but I'm surprised uh, other people are thinking this. So it's yeah. kind of important to know that. So uh, if we're in a Zoom environment where, you know, there's a pandemic hit and your C-level execs are in different countries, do you do this on a dashboard uh, like a Miro yeah. or something Yeah, we, like we actually, uh, you know, I like to keep it simple. Mm. So believe it or not, I'll actually use a Google Doc. So I'll yes. create a, I yeah, create a yeah, blank yeah, Google Doc. Google Doc, yes. Yeah, and yes. so... Yeah, everyone, everyone will, um, you know, let's say we're doing their brainstorming session. Yeah. So when they contribute an opinion, the moderator or any one assigned person will then write that in that Google Doc. Wow. So every opinion is written. So that kind of becomes it. that shared cup. Yes. Right. That's you, that Google Doc is your shared cup. Yes. And once an opinion goes there, we don't write the name next to it. Yes. Because that's now everyone's idea. It's yes. no longer your idea. Yes. Right. It's a yes. it's a community idea at this point. Yes. So, this is very impactful. Yeah. So I hosted a workshop with my co-author, a lady from Harvard. Now she's in Estonia. She works for the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. In the pandemic, the design school uh, faculty members were depressed mm -hmm. because they were isolated. In, in um, Eastern Europe, they, they live very central lives there by themselves. So we did this collaborative workshop where they could put their startup ideas on a canvas and everybody could see it. And it was so successful. They came out smiling, everyone. And uh, it's just a Google Doc. We used a Google Doc exactly yeah. like what you did. Mm -hmm. This is a technique which can uh, right. which can do Absolutely. wonders. Yeah. It can do wonders. Uh, and you, okay. So on the broader meetings things, by the way, it's very important to center around uh, some written material in my mind. Right? Yes. Otherwise, you got to see yeah. and write. See and write and exactly. engage. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, this is like you're engaging yeah. someone in different levels. Okay. But there are other kinds of meetings too, right? Um, <laughs> so there are so there are brainstorming meetings. We spoke at length about brainstorming meetings. Yeah. There are meetings where somebody is presenting something. There are meetings when you're um, kind of discussing progress on a plan. 
So each of these meetings, I have my methodology and how to run them efficiently. So we already spoke about the brainstorming one. We did brainstorming. Yeah. Uh, so we did the hiring. We did. We also hiring, did. hiring is we did uh, the meetings that happen after hiring, which is the debrief meeting, debrief right? Meeting. Where you have some written material, where everyone has written feedback. So you're basically discussing that, right? Let's talk about presentations. So a lot of meetings, people, someone or the other comes Probably and presents some work. Most important. Very important. Everybody is. So here is what important. not to do. Yeah. Have a one-way discussion. Mm. Where a presenter comes and presents, and it's kind of like a one way, right? They're most probably they're making yep. it a beauty contest. They'll yes. only talk about whatever work they're doing. Yeah. They'll talk about the good aspects of the work. They will yeah. hide the bad aspects. Yeah. And eventually, there might be a few questions at the end, like they'll yeah. do the whole presentation, yeah. or there might be some questions sprinkled in, in the middle of the talk. Yeah. Right? That should not be done. I think Amazon here has really innovated. Like, if you study Amazon style meetings, they're excellent, excellent at this, right? So what they say um, is, uh, you know, look, the the spoken word takes too much time, right? Yes. In fact, you can read through the material much faster. Yes. They even go to the extent of saying that do not write slides, write uh, narratives. I won't go that far. Sometimes slides are useful. But what I would do instead is uh, in Amazon-like way, I would divide the meeting time into uh, one third the time for just reading. Everyone is just reading the slides. Nobody's presenting. So the, um, you know, you get, the, everyone gets the slides. People don't read slides when they come to the meeting. Exactly. You're well, you don't, read. correct. You, you, you read in the, <laughs> in if you ask the them meeting, to read before the meeting, they won't, not, they won't do it. They're not going to do They're it. Not do They'll it. be rushing through traffic. Uh, correct, exactly. Yeah. You know, it, at that point, we will ask, okay, how many have read the slides and people are like, eh, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, so it's good to allot one third of the time yeah. for them to read the slides. Even if they read it, um, they can refresh it, Yeah. right? So, and then once they are done in that one third of the time to read the slides, yeah. now what you do is you only have a discussion. The presenter is not really presenting, they're answering questions so now two-thirds of the time you can have a discussion as opposed to the presenter presenting for like you know in a one-hour meeting presenting for like 55 minutes and then you leave five minutes for questions right that's like terrible you are really not really having a real discussion uh, instead now two-thirds of the time you're really having a good discussion so the presenter goes slide over slide uh, they're just flipping the pages so first slide hey do you have any questions people will ask questions they'll give it answers um, second slide, third slide, fourth slide, they're actually not presenting at that point. Yeah. They're only answering questions. That is a way more productive way to actually hold a presentation. And now what comes out is they cannot hide, you know, uh, if they have some blemishes that they were trying to hide, they were they probably, yeah. you know, either they will not mention it at all in the slides or they'll mention it somewhere in one slide somewhere. People will pounce on that. Yeah. Right? And they can have a big extended discussion on that. Yeah. So it, it becomes much harder to hide your blemishes when you follow this style, right? Yeah. So it's a way more productive way of actually holding meetings where you do not actually have these one-way presentations, which in my mind, <laughs> you know, sometimes there is useful, these are useful if you're doing a demo or something, but for the most part, I'd much follow, rather follow the Amazon style where you spend one third of the time just reading and two thirds of the time discussing. Yeah. Um, this reminds me of yeah. a flipped classroom model. Where you come to school, yeah. you have done all the reading at home, mm -hmm. come to school and you discuss with your classmates how to solve problems. Correct. And this has been generally your approach, I feel. That is, that is precisely Even correct. building a startup, yeah. you do so much homework. Yes. And when you hit the startup right. road, you are actually discussing, uh, discussing and doing That's because right. you already did your homework. Most correct. startups are hitting the road running. They don't do discussions. They do not do discussions. So they do not do the startup. From correct. the beginning. That's okay. right. Wonderful. That's right. So, so basically, people who are good at something, they live it. They do it all the time. Yes. Mm. So any change which you want to bring in your life is a lifestyle change. Do you, do you believe that? Yeah, I look, uh, you must have heard the term measure what matters. Yes, John so Dore, I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of, well, I'm not sure. Well, John Dore has a book on measure what matters. I'm not sure that he didn't phrase have a was coined. Temp template, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of the OKRs, it's a book on OKRs actually. But the, there's uh, much bigger uh, ramifications of measure what matters. So even take any project that you have in the company, right? Anything that you might be fixing, uh, sales, you know, you latch on to a metric. Yeah. First thing you do is, okay, what 
what exactly do you want to change? Yeah. So you identify that metric. Yeah. And then, so, okay, this is the metric. Okay, how does the metric look like, right? Yeah. Um, over time, right? How, what do the trends look like? Now it's all about changing it to the direction that you want, right? right? Mm -hmm. so, so the next thing, so you, you start measuring. The next thing you do is you have a brainstorming session, right? Like yeah. we discussed. Um, so why is the metric this way? Lay of the land, right? Uh, what are the ideas to make the metric go in the direction yeah, that you, you want, want to, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then a, sort of a number of things you plan of action, number of activities you need to do, and, and see a plan of action. What the naysayers will say? Uh, that's a hypothesis document. That's you know, this, 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 there are no naysayers here. This is just a bunch of people okay. who actually. In this case, if I am with my personal life, the only person is me. So there's a measure what matters. Yeah. What what are the problems I'm facing? Why am I not successful with my health goals or whatever? Yeah. What do I need to change? Yeah. Right. And uh, what's the plan? Mm -hmm. So the whole goal in a nutshell is here is what I'm measuring and how to make that trend go in the direction I want. If the trends are positive, it's just a matter of time. Absolutely. I right. If you yeah. move the trends yeah. in the right direction, yeah. it's a matter of time. Yeah. Conversely, if the trends are negative, yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> right. That through. they keep going worse and worse. Yeah. So you need to start seeing the trend, turn it in the direction that you want. Yeah. Turn it enough in the direction you want. The slope is important, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on how much time um, you want to see the measure measurable improvements, and and then just go do that. So, uh, in the case of my health, it's uh, I need to give hundred percent days. Oh right? my god! <laughs> That's and, and every day is hundred percent day. Every day, ideally, should be hundred percent day. Occasionally, I'll have a day like today, which is not a hundred percent day. <laughs> but now I can't have multiple days in a row. That are <laughs> not 100% days, right? Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. No, great. I mean, I can't believe you, the, you are like this in all 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 aspects of your life. I do. I'm sure. I, you have OKRs. Probably, yeah. Uh, correct. So, uh, OKRs are a way to measure. Right? Yes, yes. OKRs are measurement. So you start with that. Yeah. Um, then um, it's um, OKRs not just help you measure; they also help you plan. So you, they you serve could, both goals. You could be a very good life coach. I, uh, <laughs> I think you would be a very good coach. I coach two people in my company. I do? give life coaching. <laughs> yeah, so that means you're kind of training to be like a trillion dollar CEO coach. Oh, oh maybe. You know, like like maybe. the Campbell guy, right? Yeah, the Campbell guy, that's right. Yeah, that book. And he yeah. was a player. He was um, a player who became a coach. And then does, he does any coach. game inspire you? Oh, I used to play chess. I actually oh, used to like, be like well, a junior chess champion in India. Wonderful. Long back. Wow. But uh, these days... I don't have too much time for games and stuff. I would watch, you know, the finals of um, Super Bowl. I will watch the finals of NBA. I'll maybe occasionally cricket, but it um, takes too much time. It takes too much through. time. Too much time. Don't I think time. Uh, your uh, personality matches ch uh, the, the game of chess. You are uh, able to handle a lot of complexities, play with a lot of parameters. Yeah, so I was very good at that. But uh, you know, once uh, the studies became big, I had to unfortunately leave that. Yeah. I've never gone back to chess. But yeah, you're right. I became a little bit of a chess prodigy when I was very young, nice. six, seven years old. Nice. So uh, that makes you very strategic in everything you do. I, first and foremost, I'm methodical. Then, yes, uh, you know, strategy plus execution. You know, there's a saying that culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast. Yes. I actually believe execution eats strategy for breakfast. Yes. So anyone can come up with strategy, but execution is really what matters. But yeah, without a, without a good strategy, yeah. execution, you know, you may be executing on something that has a bullshit strategy, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so strategy and execution are very important, but the methodology behind it is, in my mind, the real... What is the term for that methodology? What is it called? Is it called thinking? Is it called... Uh... It's the old, I'm telling you the process, right? So measure the metrics, look at the trends. Mm. Uh, that is, it's like a methodology. It's how you do stuff, how you piece together stuff, right? You, anyone can come with a strategy. Anyone can say, okay, I'm executing the strategy. But are you executing well? Okay, well, how do you break up your execution? So I'm breaking up my execution. I'm telling you, I'll first find a metric that I need to measure. Yeah. Then I'll do a brainstorming session. Yeah. Find out why this metric is the way it is. Yeah. Then I will um, build a plan. Yeah. Then I will go execute the plan. That's yeah. my methodology. Along the way, I'll figure out which people are not good, right? Uh, yeah. And maybe upgrade them. Yeah. So it's eventually, I'll coach people. 
but people who are not coachable, I'll top grade them along the way. In the end, I want a good team executing this plan. Yeah. That's my methodology, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. there is execution plus strategy mixed into all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Strategy would come out, okay, and when you do the brainstorming, strategy will come out. At the same time, execution will also come out. Yeah. So, so notice how I'm not putting strategy and execution as the top things. I'm actually, okay, this is the way you do things. We need a methodology of doing it. We need a methodology of measuring, are you going in the right direction? We need a methodology to course correct when you're not going in the right direction. We need a methodology to build a plan to you, hold people accountable. You seem to be talking uh, like building a system. It, so that's my favorite word. <laughs> so, I, so system is the word for it. Yeah. Right. So I like to. So I, I like to give this analogy, which you might have heard before when I gave that talk earlier. Very powerful um, analogy. Yeah. I come so, from India. So yes. I'm very you, can, you can relate. So for the audience, uh, the analogy is that um, you know, look at the traffic system here in the U.S. and in India. It's the same people who will drive Un well here. Unbelievable. And the same people who in that system, in that other system, yeah. may not drive as well. Yeah. So it's actually, what, what does it tell us? It's actually not about the people. Yeah, it's about the, it's about the system. system. Yeah. So the people come second. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, there are going to be people here who in this system in the US will not drive well. Yeah. But people are secondary. Yeah. You first identify whether you have the right system. Yeah. You fix the system and then you identify, okay, uh, I've built a beautiful system. Who are the people who still are cannot comply with the system. They are the ones who then you, you know, remove from the company and whatnot, right? But yeah. system comes first. So, um, so I have built a system for execution, right? Uh, it's beautiful. It's yeah. just amazing. It's, I mean, you today you're talking about it. I've been hearing about it for so from so many people, <laughs> and it's just unbelievable that. Uh, you're talking about you pay a coach thousands and thousands of dollars to come into a company and do this. Yeah. You're building a company with this ground up. It's just so beautiful. Right. And yeah. and you and even in sales, sales is what I hear because I go to these startup master classes about what you've done with these companies. But you're starting with hiring. You're starting with ideation. This is this is totally amazing. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you about how you document things. Because I know that you always have like a mediator, mm -hmm. you have like a note taker, and uh, I have to uh, share this part of my life. I am a Toastmaster, mm -hmm. and when I joined Toastmasters, um, I made a lot of good friends, and it gave me a lot of awards. But the first role I took was note taker. Yeah, I would be in every meeting mm -hmm. taking note of everything. Today I have written three books. My third book, my investor likes the most important thing about me is I make note of every important thing he says. Yeah. And I, I have a job because of that. So note taking is something very important, I feel. For me, transcription softwares are very important. They're part of my daily life. I use them every hour. Tell me what you do with note taking in your company. How do you bring it alive in your meetings? Okay, so let's broadly use the term documentation because yeah, uh, no, training, notes are... This training also, right? Draw documentation training everywhere. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll come to that. Yeah. So first of all, no system is a good system unless it has good documentation. Correct. So I mentioned the traffic system. Correct. Notice how the traffic system is in the US is very well documented. Right. There's no ambiguity on what a stop There's sign no means. There's no ambiguity. Right? Yeah. So two people should be able to look at the documentation and tell, okay, I understand what the rules are. Yes. Right? It yes. shouldn't be that one person understands the rule this way and the other person understands the rules the other way. Right? Yeah. So every good system needs to start with the documentation. Yeah. So everything that I do in the company, I'm fixing, I don't know, the support system needs to start with documentation, yeah. right? This is how we do stuff. The sales, okay guys, this is the documentation. This is how we do sales here. Because otherwise what's gonna happen is that one person comes from company A, uh, previously before it, they joined my company, another person comes from company B, they follow different rules, right? And suddenly you have, you know, the left hand of the company is doing something very different from what the right hand of the company is doing. Yeah. We want consistency. We want uh, people in California to drive the same way as how they drive in people in, in Texas, right? Yeah. Um, same set of rules or very similar set of rules, right? So this is building a culture. It, it, it? It, the system is about a culture. Mm. So if you don't have a system, yeah. then everyone is, they're all trying to do the best themselves, but they have different thoughts in their mind. Um, so they're, you're leaving it to their own to figure out the right thing to do. And yeah. they'll probably figure it out differently. Yeah. 
but if you have a system yeah then you're basically now it becomes a game of making everyone comply to that system yes and not having everyone figure out so okay so you write the documentation you start with documentation then you train people on that documentation yeah. right but notice that training again i'm going to use driving or, or traffic uh, as an example we have the dmv handbook that yeah. has the rules we all you know read that handbook so we you know get trained on it or we'll maybe watch a video um, then we will get uh, you know there's a test right whether you know the rules or not yeah right so yeah. they now make sure that you you know the rules yeah but knowing the rules doesn't mean that you can drive now there is uh, you know sort of someone who coaches you yeah right they sit next to you and they do shadowing reverse shadowing they literally see you how you drive and once you've done that once you've learned um there is licensing so okay this mm. this person doesn't just know the rules they actually know how to apply the rules yeah. they actually can drive mm. then the next one is holding them accountable right uh, where if they are you you, dr you drove fine in front of an instructor you got the license but you were caught not doing it well mm. uh, otherwise outside of that this is very much like a driving license system it is just uh, building a system yeah. is exactly like that building wow. a good system Such is exactly a, like that yeah unforgettable analogy it, the, yeah. it is the reason the driving the driving system works is it's a perfect system that they have refined yeah. over the years they've yeah. figured out how to build a perf like all walks people from all walks of life rich poor different religious backgrounds you know different political aff affiliations they all drive well as long as they comply with the system so similarly when you build a system in a company um if you follow the way the traffic system was operationalized you will actually have full compliance yeah um so you hold people accountable who are not complying with the system you hold retrospectives when things are not going out well maybe some there are too many accidents at a traffic light yeah you'll hold a retrospective okay maybe we need to do something different here right uh, so but the three if you do like that i i have these i, I think I, i spoke about seven or eight things you need to do um, right all the way from documentation to training to Uh, yes, tests yep. and blah 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 yep, yep. in all seven or eight things but the three most important things you need to do uh is documentation right second is holding people uh, accountable and um there's one more uh, documentation training right uh, doc sorry document well train training look as long as you have documentation imagine in the world of um, you know traffic rules you don't have any training hmm. so some person just starts driving as long as you hold uh, oh, inspe sorry inspections that's that's what i was missing inspection yeah inspections and accountability so yeah. inspections means somebody randomly inspects you and then holds you accountable yeah so even if i have had no training i will be caught yeah and then i will be held accountable yeah then i how how do you hold myself accountable uh, they'll penalize me yeah force me to go read the rules yeah right so even though i got no formal training on driving i'm forced to read the rules yeah is it perfect so remember in i'm only using three key things out of eight yeah so you will get eventual compliance yeah but if you use all eight things including training and certification and licensing and what not you will get very good compliance from the get go yeah right uh, but if you i'm talking in the context of companies if you just have these three documentation inspections and accountability you will eventually get compliance it's very right? powerful without if you yeah. if you do not have one of these three you will not have a good system you know uh, ohit i'm thinking yeah. you have so much um, in depth knowledge why don't you apply this or franchise this information like a playbook to the government to build uh, special interest <laughs> zones or something like that because you're thinking such the, scale so you know? there is so much time in the day uh, so no, I mean, one maybe one day <laughs> when you're more comfortable yeah. you know moving on from your system because i i worked with niti ayog for a short stint when i worked with mit media lab and uh, they were uh, starting the ai division that modi government right. was doing and uh, it was all about building systems right. for the because india is a population of billions and how it's all you, about building systems how do you build a system like that precisely right precisely yeah. right any system needs to have these components and yes yeah. maybe one day i'll write a book but we'll let's <laughs> no amazing so i i do want to pick your brain on two right. things very <laughs> broadly one is crossing the chasm you must talk about it okay it's a, it's a it's like everybody wants to learn about this whoever has mastered this game is a <laughs> unicorn maker and another thing i want to talk about is these cycles you're you're so clear about them these mvp cycles 
early in the game and once you figure out what your MVP is in the late phase, how yeah. do you grow the company? Right. You're talking about execution loops, right. but I see there are, these are all cycles essentially. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also funding, uh, you know, you have a cycle for that. So, so, I mean, do you want to talk about the chasm and the cycles together? Yeah, or? absolutely, because they're all related. Okay. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's start, start with, with the, the crossing, crossing the chasm. The chasm. Right. So, uh, first thing is you built this, uh, you started your startup journey right. and you built your proof of concept. Is that sure. what it is? Okay. Sure. So then, um, so now you are uh, launching it. You have some people who believe in your product mm -hmm. and they want to help you refine the design uh, uh, requirements right. or they want to, and they work, want to help you improve the feature. So these are called as early adopters. So tell me how you grow the company. You're a company who is cash negative yeah. because you spent all this money building the technology. You know, tell me how we take it from here. Right. Yeah. So again, the initial setup is very important, right? Yes, the, like what you the, said. You know, the, your company needs to satisfy those filters, right? Um, it needs to have a convincing hypotheses, right? So now the setup has been set. Yeah, idea so if is I, solid. Idea yeah. is solid. You know, eventually, if we execute on the idea, it'll give us results later on, right? All right. So now, uh, the first thing we do is, um, at this point, imagine I, I've just started a company. I have a deck of slides, nothing more. Yeah. Right. It's just idea. But I've gone through those filters, so I know that once the product is made, uh, it will hit the mark. Yeah. Um, so first thing I'll do is um, do a proof of concept. Yeah. And for that, I will go ra raise some money. Not all entrepreneurs can fund it all themselves. The first uh, round of funding that you raise is called a seed capital. Seed capital, right? yeah. So you raise the seed and it's basically for a proof of concept. It's not a finished product. It's not something that a real customer would buy, but uh, definitely it proves what you're trying to do, right? Maybe it has the right UI, maybe it demonstrates um, that, hey, this is what I was out to prove and look, it's happening here. That's basically what it is about, right? Then upon seeing that progress, remember VCs are not going to give you all the money that you ever need. They're going to give you money based on the progress you're making. Right. So now that you've shown this progress, they will give you money. Uh, this is technically called a series A for uh, taking your product all the way to the point where you can launch the company. Uh, said another way, you can start actually selling the product. That's a long time. Um, it could be a one or so year, one plus years. In, right? in your space, B, B2B? Yeah, B2B, uh, yeah, one, one to two years, yeah. So you, you started uh, uh, Nutanix in 2009, officially? 2009, and we uh, reached that point, um, you know, of in... in seed. Uh, seed was pretty much immediate, right? Remember it is Your to, idea was so good, you immediately got funded? We immediately got funded, yeah. Um, remember, the Seed is there to build the proof of concept. Then the real money comes, which is a Series A, and that we raised, uh, I think, six to eight months later, after wow. after forming the company. So early. So yeah. these guys, I work with the startup founders. Yeah. Some of them take two years. That is that. Well, uh, again, they didn't set up set it up correctly, right? So they don't have a convincing hypothesis. Uh, once you have a convincing hypothesis, and show, you're showing progress on that hypothesis, uh, you can actually, you know, you can convince your VCs. It's so important. Yeah, it's very important. What you said yeah. uh, in the initial part of the podcast, right. how to pick your idea and exit Correct. is so important. So wow. they, they have not, the reason they are struggling even after two years is they didn't set it up correctly. And it's applicable to B2B, B2C? B everyone, everyone. Wow. If you set it up correctly and you show progress on that, anyone would slive it. They're like, they, they, the, hy the hypothesis is so convincing and they're showing progress on that. Yeah. Why wouldn't I fund it? Right, mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it happens. So yes, we, uh, you know, got funded. Uh, we raised our Series A. Series A is meant to take that proof of concept all the way to the launch, mm. right, uh, of the company. And um, this is where that other bigger idea comes where, uh, you know, you, you need to first roll out a MVP. Correct. But you're always working on a bigger vision. Yes. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have a bigger vision, yeah. then when you roll out the MVP, people will copy you. Yeah. Right. And now you have nowhere to go. There are tons of companies doing the same thing. Yeah. Right. So you need to have a bigger vision to yeah. execute on. Yeah. Right. So your MVP, which is basically what, uh, you know, your series A is meant for that you build your MVP and you start uh, bringing in some initial sales. And remember the MVP address is a pain. Yes. Right. For which you need an One aspirin. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's not like come, customers should say, I'll come back six months later. I'll consider it. That's an, <laughs> that's a vitamin. Okay. Right. That's not a pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if it's a real pain, they'll say, boy, I need it right now. Yeah. Right. Got Give it, it to me. Yeah. Even yeah. though it has some blemishes, it has, you know, uh, 
now the chasm happens because um, look the your the early part of the company even what you built as part of your series a you got some early adopters correct right these are yeah. people who like tinkering with technology they're okay with like a product that's not very polished and they uh, proactively give a lot of requirements they want well, they, they may they may or they may not they may or they but may these not. are the guys who actually are okay you know working with something that looks a little bit unpolished um, but that's not the bulk of the market Hmm. So this is where people make a mistake where uh, they think that some sales are happening or oh, this company is going to be like, I don't know, a unicorn hmm. or, or $10 billion company. No, the real guys, the, the real money comes after uh, because those guys are not even buying right now. Hmm. Right. Um, now, those guys is what causes that chasm. They're observing. They're, they're, they're observing or they may even try your product. But these are the people who are not used to buying a new product. Hmm. These are the people, the only reason they will even buy your product is because they have no alternative. They mm -hmm. have such a big pain and no alternative. Mm. This is why you need to have a pain uh, that you're addressing and you need to be very differentiated. So, but they will like, okay, I'm, I know this product has, I'm, imagine I'm such, such a buyer yeah. um, who's on the other side of the chasm. Yeah. Right. So, um, uh, uh, this buyer is not used to buying from uh, early stage company but what to do they have a pain yeah and they need a they need an aspirin yeah so they will put this product through a proof of concept but they'll also give a lot of requirements mm -hmm. i need this i need this i need this i need this right and that is where the startup gets to refine their product yeah right uh, and that is where they cross the chasm yeah or they're attempting to cross the chasm yeah. If they're unsuccessful, it's kind of like you're trying to jump the chasm and you die in mm. the chasm, right? Mm. So once you cross the chasm, yeah. so it's kind of like going to a bowling alley. Yeah. Right? Uh, the bowling alley, it's what happens when you go to a bowling alley. When you throw the ball, the ball might take one pin down. Or many. But when that pin falls, it'll take down more pins. Correct. So what in, the, in this world, what it means is if you satisfy one customer, you probably satisfied another five. Yeah. You go sell to the f to those five. That's fine. Uh, you get less friction. But you go sell to the sixth one. They may have a different set of requirements. Correct. Right. And when you convince them, maybe ten more customers become ready. So by the time you basically have a critical mass of customers who becomes ready. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this whole section is called the early majority. By the way, um, this whole early majority of customers, once uh, you convince a bulk of them, suddenly magic starts. That's mm -hmm. when your company becomes famous. Right? This is so tricky. How yeah. do you do that? Like this chasm crossing, yeah. like you get one person. Do we have to tell them to bring in more referrals, or is their experience so good they're going to recommend you? Correct. There's or a do lot you, of. Do you need to have like a champion or evangelist tied to every them. customer? All or of what do you have to do? All of them. So like you, you have to really, really go. You for reference it. checking. So look, everyone. If 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 you're, if I'm a customer, mm -hmm. and I bought this product. Yeah. Now I already gave a lot of requirements, a lot of pain to this uh, company. Yeah. Um, so I better be a champion, right? So now this company is trying to sell to you, which is a different company. Yeah. So you're going to talk to me. Yeah. Hey, what's your experience been? I'm, you know, look, I'm feeling a little bit antsy here. This is a new company. Yeah. And I don't want to put my job at risk. I yeah. bring a new company. What's yeah. your experience been? And I'm like, yeah, it had some rough edges, but these guys have cleaned it up. Mm. I recommend this product. I think mm. if you do this, you'll get, a, get an edge on your competition. Mm. So that tells you, okay, you know, let me also jump on this one, right? And then wow. you tell that guy, Right. Yeah. And this is how the so, selling happens. So tell me one hack which has worked for you. Like, I know this is uh, a lot of techies are to themselves building the product. Yeah. And they become the founders. Suddenly they feel very shy to talk about oh, it. No. So that's very important. So <laughs> that's very that? important. Yeah. We'll talk about how to open up. But let's first talk about the, the, the importance of that communication. Okay. So the importance is the following. Remember, you're doing something that no one has probably done before. Right. So they, the way you message it, yeah. Right. Um, may not appeal initially. Like you may come up with, okay, I'm going to talk about this aspect of the product. Yeah. Well, that may not appeal to a potential customer. Yeah. So initially, the founder has to be very involved in sales. Hmm. And the reason is, if I only tell the sales guy to go pitch, 
the sales guy, I tell the sales guy, hey, this is how you're supposed to pitch the product. They, they, they will, will not change the messaging. Yeah, they will not. They will not. They will yeah. only say what I'm, whatever I've told the sales guy. They'll go to you and say exactly the same thing. And uh, your passion won't come through because You're, no, you, they no. didn't build the product. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I need to go to lots and lots of initial customers, talk to them to figure out what's working, what's not working. And mm. eventually, when I become more ready to not go with my sales guys, I know how to train them and tell them what exactly works and what should you not say, what you should say. Mm. Right? So, uh, and given that the founders have to do this, to build a successful startup, they better come out of their shell, right? Yeah. It, they have to push themselves. Look, I'm an introvert myself, but you do this enough, you, nobody can really tell that I'm I an can't tell you're an introvert. Exactly. But nobody <laughs> nobody can. But, yeah. you know, it, it it's kind of like stage fright, right? Yeah. You do it enough, <laughs> there's no yeah. stage fright after yeah. that. No so you do it in, enough, it becomes very comfortable. Yeah, at least you have to find ways to communicate, you know, right. uh, and talk about. So where does founder-led sales start and end? Now we all, the, all the it never ends, by the way, but it's Founder. very dense at the beginning. At the beginning, uh, even the in the chasm. blue, even, even after the chasm. After the chasm. Uh, during see. the remember that during the chasm, you're collecting requirements, right? It's very important for the founder to be involved there. Yeah. Now it becomes less and less as you climb more in the yeah. blue segment, and blue segment is the early majority. Yeah. Now let's talk for the audience also about the, the the green part, which is the late majority, which basically are people who will not buy from a startup no matter what. Yeah. The only reason they will ever buy is because they see enough of the early majority guys buying, so they right. get some confidence that okay, the product must be, uh, must be you know polished enough. Like now. A Slack, you know, it was not used initially, and then by word of mouth and so much adoption and correct. But, but once using. you know, I hear that oh, eBay is also using it. Okay. Yeah. Must I, I can yeah. use it then, right? Yeah. But but if like no big company is using it, then I'm like I don't want to I don't want to touch it, right? Yeah. And then if if that's my mindset, yeah. I'm a late majority guy, yeah. right? If, but if my if my mindset is that well, yeah, it's a young company, I don't see big companies using it. But if I use it, I can see the benefit that it has. Then I'm an early majority guy. But it's going down after green, after late majority laggards. It's yeah, la it's so like few. You, you uh, correct. The laggards are the kind of guys. Uh, the um, so after the late majority for the audience, the laggards are the people who roughly will only buy a digital phone if there are no rotary phones left, <laughs> as in there's no alternative left. <laughs> okay. Right. So clearly there are less. Yeah. So uh, you know uh, the markets. If you've done your due diligence, your market is big. But the market follows this bell curve. It's a bell curve. A lot of the, the majority of the customers come in the middle. Yeah. Towards the beginning, there's going to, the early adopters are going to be less. Yeah. And towards the end, the laggards are going to be less. Yeah. But the bulk of the, uh, the uh, customers come in the middle, yeah. which is the early majority and the late majority. And so it's uh, for the success of a startup to become a unicorn, you're always addressing that early majority. Yep. If you can convince them, the late majority will come. Or the other pins Correct. will fall. Yeah. The, the other pins will fall, the late majority will come. So, you tell me, yeah. we move from bowling alley to tornado. Tornado. Tornado is a very powerful word. Right. Why do they use that? Yeah, I it's, can it's, see it's basically, look, uh, when you start the bowling alley, it's kind of like there's no one ready to buy your product in the early majority. Yeah. So, you convince one person, the pin falls, and they take down a few more pins. Mm -hmm. But once you take down enough pins, so let's say, I go to one customer, they had some concerns about your product. So you remove those concerns. Um, you go to the sixth customer, they had some more concerns. So by the time you close enough customers, all the concerns are gone. Mm. So if I go now to any customer, probably the concerns are gone. So now I can hire sales guys yeah. and sell to whoever in the early majority and they'll keep buying because and their concerns are gone. Right? That's what the tornado is about. When did uh, Kohei City hit tornado? Tornado. Yeah. How many years after you started the company? Yeah, we. I think it took us uh, somewhere from eighteen months to two years to hit the tornado. So within two I, years, you hit tornado. Yeah, within two years of launching the company. Wow. Yeah. So I think we this launched is the company. faster than your first company. Yeah, it was. Uh, because Nutanix you know. took three years. Yeah. Wow. We we took about two, and you know the the definition of a tornado is. Or uh, some people use the term hockey stick effect. Some people yeah. use the term product market fit. The definition, people get it wrong, you know, so it's very important to understand the definition. The definition as follows. If you can hire an average sales guy mm. to sell to an average customer, not an elite customer, mm. without involving people in the headquarters, mm. you have a Got tornado. tornado. Yeah. So that's your product market Correct. fit. So, so you do, remember, you cannot always hire A players as sales guys. Correct. You cannot always have 
elite customers who totally understand what you're trying to do. Like many customers are going to be average. If you can hire an average guy to sell to an average customer without involving me yeah. or other people from headquarters, because people in headquarters are a limited quantity, right? Yeah. If every sale needs to involve me or someone in headquarters, we're not scalable. Yeah. So tornado happens when I can hire a lot of average people to sell to a lot of average people. Wonderful, <laughs> That's wonderful, wonderful. So mm. th this is where I, I truly understand what product market yeah. fit is. Because I never put product market fit together crossing chasm curve with the this whole uh, uh, funding and uh, you know founder led sales is all everything is coming together now immediately after that you have main street mm -hmm. sitting right on top of late majority yeah. what is this main street concept yeah that's main street is basically late majority uh, I, I described it already main, main street is now you're in the main street people in the main street usually will not buy unless they see enough other people buying right mm. they don't otherwise you know entertain products from newer companies that's what means. they want to basically they are either buying because they feel there is enough stability or they're buying because this is the next thing they're going to left be left out mm -hmm. everyone right. else who's their competition is using it yeah so do you want to be left out no i don't want to be left out okay so 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 that, that's main street Okay, there's another street I want yeah. to talk about. When does Wall Street get interested in this stuff? <laughs> Wall Street, uh, Tornado, when you start the Tornado, tornado Wall Street, Wall Street comes in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, di different companies go IPO at different times. Yeah, um, tell, tell me about IPOs. Yeah. I want to understand. I mean, we have to come back to this, but you know, just right. quickly picking your brain. Yeah, look, eventually you're building a company. Um, you know, you know that... Um, Not everyone plans for an IPO. Lot Not everyone plans for an IPO. Happy with but an exit. Correct. So a lot you of people know? are happy with exit, but let's say, uh, first of all, a company that goes public needs to be long-term sustainable. Yes. Right? Which means that quarter over quarter, they have uh, predictable, uh, you know, whatever is predictable, whether growth is predictable or their cash flow is predictable, what is, the, the numbers they deliver are predictable, so there needs to be predictability. Yep. So, so you're ready for an IPO, uh, A, when there is, uh, either the growth is very high or, um, the the profitability is there and you have consistent history of delivering on your numbers or there is at least side to profitability right that maybe one or two years down the line you will have uh, profitability like, so any uh, amazon took a long time to be profitable well that was a uh, unusual time you know yeah. usually uh, you know if it was not the madness of the late 90s someone like amazon would probably go IPO much later. Same with Uber and Uber and Airbnb and all these people who. But these guys, these companies were making a lot of revenue, even though they were not profitable. Uh, but the revenue had grown to a big value, so there was a faith in the investors that should these companies want to become profitable, they can. And they had good traction metrics. A lot right. of people were adopting their. Technology. Exactly. So if yeah. there is wide scale adoption. Yeah. Uh, you may not be profitable, but you're still an IPO worthy company. Wonderful. Because yeah. you know, look, people understand that. Uh, when you're growing fast, uh, you're also burning money. Yes. Right? So, and if you stop burning money and you become profitable, well, it's also going to stunt your growth. Yeah. So, so sometimes, it uh, depends on times, you know, there are times when Wall Street really, uh, you know, rewards uh, companies that are highly, high, high growth companies, but bad on the profitability side. Yeah. Which is what they did to Amazon long back. Yeah. Right? Growth. Amazon was highly unprofitable, but, you know, it was a big business. Uh, and there are times like we are today where Wall Street actually looks for profitability or near, you know, you need to be, you know, fairly close to profitability. Growth, they will not reward growth. So there are two questions stemming yeah. uh, out of my mind. One is you talked about founder-led sales and that itself shows how important founder is. Now, as you go towards becoming an IPO, yeah. does that same founder mindset work here when you're getting towards an IPO? Do you need different kind of people to take over? Um, a step out of the founder's shoe yeah. and uh, people who are run very good in running execution yeah. engines and revenue engines should they step over or do you think founders should change their personality that is one thing another thing uh, i want to ask top uh, okay let, let's focus on this it'll come to look me. Yeah. if you want to run a long-term company you better have the perspective the mindset of running a long-term company founders typically are very good at ideating right uh, yeah. They come up with an idea, they implement the product, but then the day-to-day -day execution, the mundane really, things, the, the simple things, the, the simple things. things, you know, building on plans, you know, that performance management, are they really good at that? Yeah. And that's where sometimes uh, an external CEO is brought in, or maybe the founder uh, wants to stay out. in tech 
is burnt out or they want to continue to uh, just focus on technology because a lot of founders have a technical background, right? That's how they got the idea or they just want to do technology. A lot of reasons why, you know, to take the company to the next level, uh, uh, literally a professional CEO is brought in. Okay, the idea is solid, the, you know, that environment, you know, that we talked about is there. Now you take it to the next level. And we also, uh, it's not just the CEOs and founders, but we know that every role, yeah. uh, a person in that role may not scale all the way like tens of years. Maybe they're good for the current phase of the company, mm. but two yeah. or three years later, you yeah. might need a different persona. It's the same for the for the CEO. Uh, you may need a different persona. Uh, what is a typical good CEO? What, who is a star CEO, according to you? If you want to bring someone in. Who, yeah, I can give examples. Hiring, hiring, you're hiring I, I, I can, yeah, yeah, I can give examples. In my mind, I mean, I uh, I really like Frank Sutman, for instance, right? Uh, that's, in my mind, a very good CEO. Um, you know, lately, I uh, I read this book, Winner's Dream, from uh, Bill McDermott at, uh, at ServiceNow, and I think that would be a great CEO. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the star CEOs in my mind, right? Um, and they, uh, everyone has their their thing, right? I mean, a lot of the methodologies I was talking about, uh, calibration meetings and whatnot, I actually am influenced by Frank Rutman's thinking on that. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, Bill McDermott has some amazing things to add too, like the way he sets the vision. So all the way from when he was not a CEO, when he was, um, you know, sales guy at Xerox. They have incredible stamina. Incredible, incredible. Well, the so grit. Long. Well, first of all, grit needs to be there. Right. If you don't have grit, don't be a long-term CEO. Right. Uh, CEO job is very tough. If you don't have why the perseverance, is, why is it, that? Why is a CEO job tough? Well, think of it like this: um, a CEO job is kind of like a symphony uh, conductor. Right. They, the good things that are happening in the company stay where they are. Everything that is bad bubbles up to the CEO. Hmm. Right. Now the CEO has to deal with. Sometimes bad things happening in this department, marketing, then engineering, then support, so then some customer is going south, then some competitor is doing something, then some lawsuit is... So basically they're dealing with a lot of breadth. Yeah. Right? And it's a very lonely job. A lot of right. context switching. A lot of context switching. So they don't have the luxury to kind of stay deep on one thing. And they can't talk openly also. They cannot. So it actually is a very tough job. Right, it's so, not a better roses at all. How does a lonely, uh, how does a CEO find a person to talk to? Who is yeah. the person they can talk to? Well, sometimes they, I know some very good CEOs who have executive coaches. Mm. Sometimes they talk to the board. Sometimes they'll have a few people who are very trustworthy in the organization in the that they that they like talk to. Tim Cook for Steve Jobs and yeah. uh, I don't know. So Tim, um, Steve Jobs, uh, I'm Gates, sure had a crack. Gates and Bomber. Gates yeah. and Bomber. Yeah. So, so they typically had their favorite people they talk to. But even so, I can tell you, I had, when I was a CEO, I recently gave up the job, but uh, uh, when I was a CEO, I had a few people I can talk to, but even there, I could not talk about everything. Yeah. Right, there are some things I cannot talk about. Um, it's just a tough job, that's basically it. And, you because know, you're carrying the weight of so many employees. You carry the weight of, correct. And you're reporting to the board, and also right. the Wall Street is looking at you. And, and the external world, right? Correct. Uh, so, I've had situations where I knew that some person is not the right fit for the role, yeah. But because everyone's looking, and oh my God, uh, you have to tolerate that. You have to tolerate. At that. the same time, it's you have just... to make the company perform. Yes. So it's, it's very not hard. Easy. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. So um, at this point, what what kept you going? Like, is there something you can share uh, to the founders or anybody who is in a stressful job? Yeah. Uh, to stay sane and to keep <laughs> you. I can see you're very fit. <laughs> and I see that you're very disciplined, but really, uh, in those moments, you want to break all this. You want to yeah. break free, right? What What was working for you? Yeah. Well, one thing is, uh, I've always had a lot of grit. You know, taught to be me, my my parents, my father, right? I I'll I can fall down, but I'll get up and run again, right? So if you don't have grit, uh, you shouldn't do this, right? Very honestly, you should just join a cushy job. Right? There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. Um, yeah. Right, uh, but if you really want to be a founder, you need to have a lot of grit. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, or bring like do it with co-founders. Bring another CEO at the right time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those yeah. are all perfectly fine things to do. Yeah. But um, to actually help, you know, with your grit and whatnot, I would really encourage founders to build like a, a routine yes. in their life. Yeah. My routine is 
I spend about every day, you know, about one and a half hours, half of it on my mental health and half of it on my physical health. Mm. Without that, I will not be able to function, right? Uh, because Absolutely. there's so many ups and downs yes. in the company um, yeah. that your... you need to, that roller coaster, yeah. it wears you down. It's death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. And <laughs> unless you have yeah. the mental fortitude, so you need to literally work on your mental health. Yeah. Right. Uh, whatever so, the multiple ways, you know, um, you can do whatever mindfulness, meditation, what have you. Right. Um, uh, I personally took some, um, you know, uh, I did some programs from Isha Foundation. They were very helpful. Um, awesome. So that's for my mental health. Mm -hmm. My physical health, you know, I'm sure there are tons of uh, you definitely coaches and stuff. watch what you eat. You're very careful about what yes, you eat. I, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what what else to do? Physical health. I so th those two are uh, a must: phys yeah. physical and mental health. Yeah. Then that's how I start my day. Then yeah. beyond that, uh, you know, you uh, time management. Your, you start your day. Like I start that. my day like ah. that. Then so it's how you start your day and how you end your day. End your day. Right? Ending my day, I uh, always sit and build my schedule for the next day. So I love that. time management is very important. I love that. Yeah. I do so the, 15 minutes, you yeah. know, it's 15 minutes well spent. Yes. Every day before you go to sleep, Absolutely. Um, yeah. you know, the last thing you do is you build your schedule for the next day. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that 15 minutes of clarity on what you can or should not do the next day yeah. will take you a long way. Because otherwise, yeah. life is very reactive, right? Things keep getting thrown at you. Um, so you need to literally schedule the important things, right? There's uh, the concept called the Eisenhower's matrix, if you may have yes. heard about it, right? Yeah. So you have urgency on urgent one axis important. and importance on the other axis. Correct. Everyone will do things that are urgent and important. Yeah. But it's the stuff that's not urgent but important that really defines you. Yeah. And you need to literally schedule that. Mm -hmm. If you do not schedule it, Right, like you'll health, never get that. Health issues. Health. Uh, that, I made that uh, a routine. Important. Right. Routine. It, I made that a habit. So it happens because of the habit. But let's say um, you need to do something in your company. You know, maybe you need to start a new initiative. Um, mm -hmm. There's no urgency. But, but if you done. don't get to it, it'll yeah. never happen. Yeah. Like. So mm -hmm. those are the things, and you may want to schedule a brainstorming meeting on that. Yep. So literally, those 15 minutes at night, I'm like, okay, how do I need to plan my next day? Yeah. There's al already some meetings in the day. Yeah. And I make sure that there's plenty of uh, times available for me. I tell my admin to reserve literally, you know, four or five hours for myself where I get to decide what I do, right? Yeah. And the remaining time, four or five hours, they can take for meetings, right? So those four, the, uh, there is a reactive time and there is proactive time. The reactive time I is like where that. I'm already booked. Yeah. Some customer is meeting me, some something is in someone inside the company is meeting me, I'm having some meetings, so that's time is already booked. There are some a few hours that I reserve that I decide literally the last night, um, right? What am I gonna do in those hours? Yep. And that's when that not urgent but important work happens. No, right? it's this is very powerful, I can tell. Yep. Uh, anyway, I do four AM meditation, Isha meditation, but 4 a.m. is when I plan my day. I don't do it previous night. I'm, I'm thinking you I'll push it to the pick, previous pick, night. Pick a time, just stick to it. Yeah. Pick a time and stick to it. Um, so I happened to do it the last night. Um, it's better actually. If you see your calendar the previous night, it's I, much I better. look at my calendar, I jot it down, I wake up, I know exactly what I need to do. Right. So I don't wake up and then design my day. I do it the previous night, but I see you know, not much wrong with doing it as long as you're doing it. Uh, make it part of your morning routine, right? You do your men your mental exercise, you do your physical exercise, and you build your routine. You can do that. That's Wonderful. fine. But uh, the important thing is to do it, uh, not when you do it, but do it consistently. Right? So literally every night, it just takes 15 minutes, just do it. Yeah. So now, you know, if you look at any philosophy book, it's they all say stay in the present. So this helps me stay in the present. Mm. It's not so much about what could happen one month from today or you've, what happened in the past. You've simulated your present. Exactly. So it's basically yeah. what am I supposed to do that day? Yeah. Yeah. And as long as I have clarity about that, you know, it's at that point, um, the gains will keep adding. And uh, I think we started the conversation by you saying, who's Mohit? And <laughs> I, I responded by saying, Mohit is just a simple guy. All he cares about is what he's going to do that day. Because That's it. <laughs> so much planning has gone into making that right. happen. So, but if you do the day right, Yes. The gains add up over time. Yes. It's very people comp people compound. look at yeah, they yep. compound. Yep. People look at those gains. They don't realize it's actually a lot of small things you do that add up. And so if you just do that day correctly, 
where you have the right mental state, you have the right physical state, and you're planning it and you're doing the right things, eventually it'll happen. Yeah. Nobody can say, you know, uh, anything that you plan, right? When Mike Tyson said, uh, you know, plans go uh, or even you get hit, 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 in, the, hit in the face. Everyone yeah. has a plan until they yeah. get hit in the face. Yeah. So you will get hit in the face. But if you, again, you know, okay, you got hit in the face. What do I do now? Correct. You know, okay, let's go do this. Let's change course, whatever. You do this day over day over day over day and, you know, you'll make these minor course corrections and eventually goodness will happen. Wonderful. You seem to be a very focused person. You know, uh, what I feel is you put your head to one thing and you do it all the way. Yeah. Not, not everybody is like that. Uh, how, well, do you, how do you get that kind of focus? I can see Kohi Siri has been your focus now. Before that, it was Nutanix and before that, it was Google. Google. Um, is this uh, natural to you because you do what you love? Or have you, is it because of the way you're educated in IIT? Or how do you get that focus like? I think it's a couple of things. Uh, number one, I have that, you know, I need clarity on that metric. And where it, where is it today and where it needs to get to. That's all, all that matters, right? Uh, and I will, damn it, push it in that direction. Yeah. So as an example, yeah. I need clarity on when I start the company, okay, the world is here and it needs to get here through yeah. the company. Yeah. And damn it, now I'm on that, mm. right? So it's, I am so fixated on that metric or that thing and everything else is just noise after that. That gives you most happiness. Correct. So that's why you fixed, uh, that, fixed so, so now coupled with that, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So I'll keep working on that and I have a lot of grit. So I'll keep working on, take, give me any project. Uh, you know, whatever that metric is and wherever it needs to be, I'll keep working on it uh, with grit, with focus. The mental exercises help to keep my focus. Uh, the, the time management helps to for, for me to not, you know, run around here and there. Every day I'm doing something about it. Yeah. Right? So once it starts with complete clarity on where we are and where we need to be. Once I have that, then I'll keep fixating on that. If you need to lose weight, you know the best way to lose weight? You just decide one day, Okay, this is where I am. This is where I need to be. And then you every day measure, every day look at that new weight you need to be. And you keep making changes every day, course correct every day until you get there. That's how you lose weight. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's the same in doing any project or building a company. You decide where you are currently, where you need to be, and you just keep working on getting there. So what people do is they lose the way along yeah, the way, right? They lose the way. They yeah. lose the way. They kind of want to get there, but they're, uh, you know, they will not do anything in the day to help get there. They're not scheduling their time, right? They're not doing a single, you know, they're not even spending one hour in the day to do something for that. Yeah. They'll actually do things that are counterproductive to that. Yeah. Right, in the case of, you know, if you don't lose weight, they'll actually Eat. go party yeah. too much, right? Yeah. Uh, so now you're counterproductive. Yeah. You know, you decide what it takes for you, if you're here, you want to get there, what it takes for you to make a micro progression in that direction. Yeah. Right, and then you do that in the day. Then you do that the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and you'll get there. <laughs> you know, there are so many books written about it, like yeah. the Rule of Ten Thousand, yeah. the Tipping Point, Malcolm right. Gladwell. Um, I don't think you'll need that because you're anyway putting in ten thousand hours anyway. Until you look, see if it. if you're exactly if this methodology helps you put those ten thousand hours. Yeah. So I don't care whether it's ten thousand hours or whether it's two thousand hours, but yeah. until I reach that metric, I'm going to keep working on it. Yeah. Wonderful. Right. So oh, that's how you do like it. amazing. I'm getting a lot of life coaching lessons here. <laughs> but you know, I want to go back to that thought which I lost. Growth versus profitability. I've I've been with the Silicon Valley founders for like eight years now. Any event I go to, whenever a VC sits and there's a round table of founders or entrepreneurs, they always ask him, what is more important, growth or profitability? In one season there is one answer, yep. another season there's one answer. What is this whole game and how to yep. play this game? Um the, the, you don't look at the seasons. Look, you only care about this question when you come close to actually filing an IPO. Mm. Uh, you got to be close to an IPO. You got to be reasonably close to profitability, right? But otherwise, my suggestion, it's all about growth. Yeah. If you're growing fast, uh, growing fast what, what's yes. what's the Get fun? Get ahead. Well, actually, what's the fun in building, let's say, a profitable company that only has 10 million in revenue versus a high growth company growing at, I don't know, 50%, 60%, 80% that has, I don't know, 500 million in revenue. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the way to think about it. Mm. 
If you have high growth, mm. you will get to 500 million fast. Yeah. If you have low growth, but you're profitable, let's say I'm profitable at $10 million, but it's low growth. Yeah. Okay, five years later, I might become a $20 million company. Oh, that's, there's no fun in building that company. So high growth trumps profitability anytime. Yeah. It's just that when you come close to filing an IPO, you need to be mindful of profitability. Because okay. Wall Street may not have you have a good IPO if uh, the profitability is not there. So that's yeah. why they came up with this rule of 40, right? Where they yeah. combine you know, growth with profitability and it better be kind of combined be 40. Either your growth needs to be very high, right? Even if you're unprofitable. So if you take the growth, remove the profitability from it, the net should still be 40, yeah. right? Or if you're not growing, right? Or not growing too much, then your um, profitability needs to be high enough such that you know, you still get that 40. So either the profitability needs to be high or growth needs to be high or the combination of both needs to be higher than 40. So that's why they came up with this rule of 40. Rule of 40, right? yeah. But uh, But typically I can tell, you know, what matters in different environments is um, you can have the rule of 40, but different environments will just punish a highly unprofitable company. Or maybe they will, in a different environment, you'll, uh, you know, reward a high growth company. Uh, but rule of, if you don't have rule of 40, you may not be able to go IPO. So, so rule of right? 40 is something. So rule of 40 is a must. And design a company uh, yeah. which will last, uh, you know, through the growth phase and be profitable in, in the, yeah. In, yeah. And and Different. that happens, by the way, if you do that setup correctly, in the, if yes, you setup. build the right environment, <laughs> exactly. right, it'll happen. If you don't have the right environment, sooner or later you'll run out of steam, right? Then you become an acquisition target. You'll only survive in a acquisition. So if you build a, a, a company, if the environment is correct, if the trends are right, um, if your hypothesis is correct, you can keep innovating in the company for, for a long time. Yeah. Right? And and keep building it bigger, 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 bigger. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So, Mohit, I think <laughs> I can keep talking to you, but we have to close the podcast at some point. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to um, ask you this. You know, if you had, uh, let's say, you, you know, you're not at Cohesity, you had $10 million, what is a company you would build? Oh, uh, <laughs> look, the, the, again, I'm all about methodology. Um, so the question would be, what's the methodology I would use? What's right? the method um, methodology you would use? I would use the methodology. I would probably, what I'll do is, uh, I I will not venture out too far away from my core expertise or the expertise of my co-founders. It is possible that I have co-founders who have some expertise that I may not have. Like as an example, Elon Musk did not have expertise in um, uh, space stuff, but he worked with some people that did. Right, so that's how he did SpaceX and that sort of stuff, right? So anyhow, um, your initial group of co-founders or wh whoever you're working with, they have some expertise. So that's the area generally where you are able to do companies. So I will divide up that area into multiple segments, right? So for instance, in my case, it could be security, it could be AI, it could be uh, some other data related stuff, right? So I'll divide up in these segments. I will then study all the companies that got funded in these areas in let's say the last three to five years. And that gives me those trends on where the world might be going in the and future. Stack them. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, stack them and, and figure out where the potential gaps will be. What are the wow. problems of tomorrow? And then I will choose, <laughs> okay, this problem is something that I think I can do something about. Yeah. I think I have an idea to do a company there. And then I'll take, and there may be multiple ideas, right? Maybe a company possible here. There may be a company possible here. I'll take all those companies and figure out what's the most promising one that I really am getting excited about. And I'll take that and put my $10 million in that. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful answer. Yeah. So, uh, if if Mohit is an investor, we know where to get, <laughs> where what he's looking at. Oh, by the way, will you ever invest in a domain which you're not familiar with? Um, Education or maybe like saving if I'm, if, the planet or something like that. Uh, well, there is familiarity and then there is belief. So, there are there are you know, domains that I'm familiar with, but I don't believe in them. I will not invest in them. Mm -hmm. um, there are domains where I am not familiar with them, but I do see their potential. Yeah. I will still invest in them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so invest or not, not invest is one question, but the amount I invest is another question. If there's yeah. a, if it's a, if it's something I believe in, it's a domain I know, uh, and I know the people can do a good job, I'll actually, Invest more. Now, I'm not an avid investor, by the way. I just want to, you know, give that. I, I, you know, I don't uh, do investing for a living. I 
build companies for a living, right? So whenever I do invest, it's either to just help a friend. I mean, look, I may not even believe in the idea. I may not even, you know, I'm kind of antsy on whether that company will become big, but I, I, it's for helping a friend. They want my name. Uh, so I'll put a modest amount. What about things which need to be done? Sorry? Like something which needs to be done, like the traffic problem in India needs to be fixed. Yeah. The so North if I see, if I see a promising company, Mm, you know, I it? may actually help the company and put some money in. Uh, right? Okay, I think this is a worthwhile problem to solve. If humanity is really going to improve or if some section of society is going to improve uh, or in some geography and I feel comfortable that this team can actually take it to the next level. Uh, it's very important. The team is very important. Right? Yeah. The same idea, yeah. multiple teams, yeah. you know, they'll take it, you know. You want to give the money to worthy, to worthy, worthy people. people, right? Yeah. Um, and I also need to be in a position to actually hear how they're doing, right? If Correct. they're too far, sometimes it's only a company in India. I have no touch with them. Uh, okay, it looks like a promising team, but you know, I won't know if they go south, right? No, I agree with you because yeah. Sudha Murthy does philanthropy like right. uh, uh, f exactly with the filters which you talked about. Right. If she buys her own book in a store, she asks for writer's discount. Yeah. She is very careful with money. <laughs> with all the money in the world, right. they could do anything. She's extremely careful. And that's what keeps the world. Correct. So you know. sometimes people think that, you know, well, what's it's a small deal for him. Correct. But no, that's, you know. It's not. I, I, it's small things that matter. It's small things that matter. Yeah. It's no. small things that matter, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I like to say that if I'm not disciplined on this, yes. I will also get not disciplined on a lot of other things. Yes. I'm, I want to be disciplined on everything. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's not like uh, I'll just throw away the money. I'll do my due diligence and then make a judgment on how much I want to invest. So that's yeah. kind of how I'll do it. Wonderful. So I'm very reluctantly, I want to bring this conversation to a close. I had like uh, the most amazing high performance coaching from the most high performing CEO, uh, CTO in Silicon Valley, uh, a serial unicorn builder. I don't know what else is out there that you're going to change. You you've impacted billion lives multiple times and I'm sure you're going to impact many more billion lives to come. Thank you so much, Mohit for this uh, priceless time you spent here. Somebody with so much knowledge and impact, I just want to say thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me here. And just like I said, it's all about doing the best every day. Yeah. And uh, that's how you give back to the world and to the society, right? So plan your day, do the best you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, continuously improve, push yourself, you know, brainstorm with yourself how yeah. you can improve further. Yeah. It's the best you can do. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much, Mohan. Yeah. Yeah.